What's up, motherfuckers? How are you guys doing this week? I hope you had a good one, and welcome to another episode of A Taboo Life, where everyone has a story to tell. Come check out the website, ataboolife.com, where you can read some interesting articles, download other episodes of podcasts, read some poems, because I am that sappy, and some short stories, such as A Bar Full of Prophets, an inappropriate and possibly sacrilegious short story. It's a story about all, all the religious, all the religious deities in a bar together, and what happens throughout the night. And another story, which is near and dear to my heart, and helped inspired me to uh, pursue this podcast titled "Tell Me Your Story," a chapter from at the end of all things. Uh, at the end of all things is a book I've written. It is on. It is available as ebook and also on a website too. Uh, it's free on the website, but you will have to pay for it as ebook. But check out the website ataboolife.com. Today's guest is Mr. Andrew or Drew. He is a friend of mine. We were he's still a police officer, but we were police officers together. We he is currently a patrol officer, a bomb technician. Um, he's still in the military right now, but if I remember this correctly, he is leaving uh, sometime this month. Great guy. He has a lot to say. We talk about the, um, the stresses of working as a po- police officer, being in a tribe, thinking for yourself, and and some hunting, too. We talk about a little about hunting, but this is a great episode if you want to get into the mind of cops and active duty cops. If you are a um, cop hater, please listen to this episode because I'm pretty sure this will change your mind. Andrew is a great guy to talk to, very, uh, very personal, very wise. I thought he was older than me until now I was older than him. But it's really grateful for him too because I went to do the episode as home in Georgia and he gave me some, uh, some deer meat and I ate some of it today. Some back straps and it was absolutely delicious. But no more talking. Here's the episode and I hope you guys enjoy it. Or it's got to be like masterfully edited. If you try editing, but you suck ass, and it comes across at you, like it's, it's like, why'd you even just get out of here? I don't want to watch this. I gotta click some other shit. You know. All right, guys, we're live. I did not tell <laughs> Andrew or Drew that we were live. I just wanted to start talking, and I like yeah, I, I just did it just to fuck with you. But no, no, yeah, no, we're we're live. So, want I want to introduce a good friend of mine. We worked together back in the day. Oh yeah. Uh, this is uh, Andrew or. We we'll go with Drew. Drew's good. Uh, we were cops together. He's still a cop. Um, I'm not anymore. Obviously, if I talk about uh, smoking <laughs> weed, <laughs> right? And among other exploits. But won't you introduce yourself and uh, tell us who you are? Oh yeah, I'm Andrew. Uh, I'm 29. I'll be 30 this month. Shit, I thought was, uh, I thought you were older than me. No, man, I'm, I'm young, man. Fucking young. <laughs> I thought man. you were like 32. I'm no, like 30. no, I started. I started early. <laughs> Uh, I am a police officer. Um, that's kind of the unfortunate thing about being a cop. And Frank, I know you know what it's about, man. Yeah. You're always introduced by your profession. Yeah. And aside from being a doctor, like nobody else is introduced by or their profession. Or firefighter. Really. Yeah. Or, well, they're, they're going to they're tell you. you know? <laughs> the firefighter. They're not going to give you a chance. But uh, yeah, man. Uh, married, father, two little girls. Uh, live in Southeast Georgia. Mm-hmm. Uh, doing the Lord's work. And you're a veteran. Yes. Yeah. Well, I spent some time in... Um, Army National Guard, I still am. Mm-hmm. Uh, deployed to Afghanistan before. Oof. So. so we got a lot to talk about. Maybe. Let's see. <laughs> All right. Um, let's start from the beginning. So what came first, a cop or uh, the military? The military. The military, actually. Uh, 17 years old. I joined the military. 
Uh, I had to get my mom uh, to sign a, a release waiver. Oh, yeah, the waiver. Or, or slip to let me go in at 17. Uh, but, yeah, I went in at 17. And I didn't become a police officer until I was 22. So. Oh, yeah, you did a lot young. Yeah, you were, you were in there as a cop longer than I was when I started, but you were younger than me. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you came on a couple, like, a, I think I've been on like a year and a half. Yeah, I came on in 2011. Oh, you came on in 2011? Mm-hmm. Oh, so it was that class? So I started in 2011, so we were closer than I thought. Yeah, right okay, on. yeah, I, did, I thought you were in there for a year, like a year before me. <laughs> no, man, it would have been like six months, six to nine months okay. before you. So we were closer <laughs> than we thought. So, yeah. Um, so you deployed. What was your um, your job or your, was it MOS? Yeah, so when I first went in, man, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to, I was doing this dual enrollment thing because I was homeschooled. And, oh, okay. uh, I was going to Augusta Technical College and I was studying automotive technology. So I had this deal, man. I wanted to be like a Porsche technician. I loved, <laughs> I love 911s, man. I love Porsches. I wanted to work on cars. And so I was going to the automotive tech program there at age 16. Um, and then into 17. When I turned 17, I was talking to this recruiter and he was like, yeah, man, check it out. We'll get you. You'll come in. You can be a mechanic in the guard and then you can get money for school. So I talked to these guys at uh, this, uh, UTI and, and NTI um, uh, college. And it was about this you know, Porsche technician program. They had them down in Florida, also in North Carolina. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go in the guard as a mechanic. <laughs> Then I'm going to go down here to Florida. I'm going to learn how to work on 911s, man. I'm going to work for Brumos Porsche, and that's what's going to be. <laughs> that's what's Brumos going to be, up, right? So uh, I ended up, ended up getting a GED, mm-hmm. joined it when I was 17, went in as a mechanic, a wheeled vehicle mechanic. It was a 63 Bravo back then. Um, I did that, and then I, I really started liking the whole idea of – being a soldier and shooting and being in the field and doing real stuff like that more so than the mechanic stuff. Also, the more I worked in mechanic stuff, like on the side, Mm -hmm. outside of the the military, the more I realized it's kind of like a, I don't want to use the term dirty, but by and large, that industry takes advantage of people. Yeah, uh, they they take money from people that don't know any better. They take money from old ladies and and, and stuff like that. And I was too nice, and mm. that stuff kind of kind of made me mad when I saw that stuff happening. Yeah, I briefly worked for a um, Toyota dealership, mm-hmm. and I'm just glad I got a better job out of that. But a month in there, I saw how shady it was. It's shady, and, man. And snakes and oh well, yeah, he, it's like a really just a disgusting environment in general. Yeah, it's bad, dude. So I didn't, I didn't really like that. So I started leaning more towards the other side. I looked at uh, some police stuff. Fuck, that's good. It's good. You like <laughs> it? It's not bad. Um, I looked at, uh, I looked at some police stuff then early on because I had some family that was in the police, um, in the police force or sheriff's departments, different areas. So I was tempted. Um, I actually ended up applying with a, I guess to, to do pre-service is what it was called. And so that was like paying your own way through the police academy and then getting picked and then trying to go as a certified guy yeah. to go get hired somewhere. So I was looking into that. I applied to this police academy in Augusta. Uh, one of there got accept- accepted. Me and a guy played uh, high school baseball, homeschool high school baseball mm-hmm. with, uh, actually took the test the same day, got accepted. But then I was still trying to go to the infantry um, in the National Guard. Well, my uh, battalion commander would not allow me to switch brigades. So I was under the uh, under troop command in Georgia mm-hmm. um, doing the mechanic stuff. And then all the infantry uh, units are in the 48th Brigade. So they wouldn't let me switch. But they said, hey, a 10th is deploying. Um, they're a sapper unit. I was like, what's that? They're like combat engineers. They blow shit up. <laughs> and I was like, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> and I was like, uh, I was like, well, let me let me get some of that. You know, they're like, yeah, man, they're not going to Iraq, but they're going to Afghanistan. So I was like, cool, let me go down there. So came in as a mechanic. What year was switched this? to a combat engineer? So I came in in 06 okay. into the military. Uh, I actually signed paperwork at MEPS June 6, 
2006. Oh, wow. So 666. I was, six, signing, six, six. I was signing paperwork away for six years <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the Georgia Army National Guard. Uh, that would have been... That would have been mid two thousand eight is when I was transitioning from then mm-hmm. from there back to uh, to the eighteenth to go become a combat engineer because I I remember that I wasn't old enough to be a full fledged police officer then because I was twenty or I was nineteen at the time and a lot of agencies were like nah man you're not old enough mm-hmm. go do this pre service thing or they offered to hire me into the jail. Uh, as Ooh. a jailer corrections officer, and I knew then I did not want to do. Yeah, that's a rough job. I did not want to do that job. <laughs> that's a really bad job. To this day, mm-hmm. I do not want to do that job. No, it's terrible. So, so after that, um, when did you go to Afghanistan? So I ended up going to Afghanistan. We left in, I think it was October. It was late October, two thousand and nine. Uh, because I turned 21 on the plane. <laughs> Holy uh, shit. From, yeah, we, we, la- oh we landed in, uh, we didn't land in Shannon, Ireland. We landed in, I think, like Han, Germany or something. And they wouldn't even let us, they wouldn't even let us out of like the, the terminal, man. We were on lockdown. So we landed there, got on another plane, and then flew to Manus mm-hmm. in Kyrgyzstan, Manus Air Force Base. And we would then go from there to Afghanistan. But I turned... Uh, 21 on the way, and I've got a picture. One of the pilots was walking through the aisles, like thanking people for their service. And my buddy Steven's like, yo, it's his birthday or whatever. He just turned 21. And they were like, well, we can't give you any alcohol, man, but here you go. And they gave me some wings, you know, like they give kids. Mm. And I, <laughs> the well, I, I got a picture on my Facebook, man. I'm, I'm wearing uniform, military uniform, 21 years old, young, dumb, and, you know, full of stuff. Uh, going to Afghanistan to do to do the Lord's Full work. Of yeah, with, yeah, with some with some wings pinned on my chest, man. Yeah, good times. Yeah, we were talking um, before we started doing the episode about the book um, "Tribe" or "Tribal." I, I keep forgetting the name of the title, but by Sebastian Younger. And we're talking about um, this misconception with why people want to go back. A certain part of the population wants to go back to war, like with the military. And um, it says not because they enjoy killing people. It's the actual un- the family unit that forms with the military. Uh-huh. And you said you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, certainly, man. That shit's real. So it was weird for me because, you know, I'm so young. I'm still impressionable at that point, I guess. Uh, I come back from Afghanistan or I go to Afghanistan, lose my innocence, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I come back from Afghanistan. Dude, I was back. Um, I got back in fall two thousand. Like late September, early October, 2010. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I had opportunity to extend and transition to active duty and do some other stuff. And that was really appealing to me. Yeah. I spoke about it with my wife. She was like, um, she was like, no, 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 no. You know, you, you talked about being the police. Why don't you give that a shot? If you don't like it, then go active duty. I was like, all right, cool. We'll do that. So I came back, man. I was back like two months I was putting in applications and I already, and within two months, month and a half, I started the application process with the department that I work for now and got on right into that. Well, that eased some of my transition, but it also kind of helped hurt me, I guess, a little bit with with some uh, some PTSD kind of issues really? and some, yeah, some different stresses and stuff. See, because like when I work with you, I'm, you were always level headed. Like well, I, I, I never, was yeah, at work, because, work because of that, because of that tribe thing, man. Mm-hmm. So. It was not the same as the military. Mm-hmm. Um, it was not the same as being deployed, but I still, when I would come to work, um, I'd have all my people there, you know, we're out there all have kind of a common mindset because we're all doing a dangerous job and yeah. everything. And we just got to kind of come together and be kind of a, kind of a unit, kind of a team, not the same, not as strong, but kind of a team, you know, and team atmosphere and go out there and put in work. But then when I would come home, that's when stuff would kind of fall apart on me. So, but the being at being at work in the police department was was close, and I actually ended up getting out of the guard. I ATS in 2012. Oh, good. I was mad at some stuff. Went four years, and I got back in in 2016. So August 2016, I reenlisted in the guard because mm-hmm. I missed that part of my life that, that that kind of tribalism, that unit kind of feeling, man, and uh, it brought it back to me. Um, I re-enlisted with the idea of deploying 
mm. to Afghanistan coming up here soon in January. My brigade is deploying. And uh, I was supposed to go, man. I've been training for the past two years to go. And then I found out a couple of weeks ago that I'm actually not going uh, because of some circumstances. So, Oh, shit. Yeah, my, my reenlistment falls in the in the middle of the deployment. Okay. And I've elected not to reenlist because some people in my unit kind of burned a uh, EOD, explosive ordnance disposal, mm-hmm. job I was trying to transition to. And it made me pretty mad. So my... my my immediate goal is to transition to the Air Force National Guard, pursue some stuff in that. Why not the Navy? The Navy um, has a good um, EOD squad. Well, so the Navy, the Navy's lit, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, Navy EOD, and, and I may be speaking out of pocket, but yeah. my understanding is they are they fall under SOCOM, so they're part of the Special Operations Command. Yeah. They are the Special Elite, Operations Elite. EOD contingent, and I think mm-hmm. the Army has a, a Special Operations or Special Operations capable unit or units within EOD Mm -hmm. and there's some EOD guys that are attached to some JSOC units and stuff like that but by and large Navy EOD is is no joke those guys are those guys are serious but no I'm looking at doing it on the side man just to scratch that itch give me a little bit of something to do (laughs) there's other reasons too but I miss that I miss that kind of tribalism you know kind of kind of being being together being in the field mutually going through like really shitty situations or being cold or hot or miserable with other dudes, man. That just, for some reason, that's cool. Because you're going, you're going through that together. Right. It's like, um, I'll tell people, like, one of the few things I miss about being a cop is the camaraderie. Mm-hmm. Like, I, after working for uh, Disney and other jobs, um, which were actually good-paying jobs, I really do miss that part of it. Like, actually, uh, even though if you may hate one of the guys that you work with, like, you know, okay, this guy's a fucking jackass. Um, you know, you got, he, he has your back and you got his back too. Absolutely. Something bad will happen. Yeah, you hear him calling for help or something, man, or you hear him stop something. Yeah, that, that stuff goes you're, on the side of your head. Yeah, like, you, go, you, you, you hear go. his voice go up. You can <laughs> tell, man. You can tell when you work with people and you can tell when that dude's scared. And, man, you will, you will, you will waste no time getting to him, man. You know, you know how it is. Yeah. Actually, uh, I was going to bring up the story. I'm not sure if you remember it, but um, you do. There was a, you and the CSU unit were doing a chase somewhere, um, a foot chase. Oh, I forgot the name. It was off a of White Bluff and uh, that intersection. Anyways, it was behind the mall somewhere. Mm-hmm. And you guys were running, running through the neighborhood. And I remember this because I was laughing to myself because I, I was on my way to you. And. You're just chasing a guy, and then you hear Casey gun on the radio and say, he has a gun. And turn out, at the time, she was talking about one of the neighbors came out of the house. Oh, I and remember it, this. Yeah. I remember this. But too. I was laughing at you because you came on the radio, and you, you literally, you could hear yourself pumping the brakes. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. he has a gun. Because <laughs> you didn't know at the time that he, she was talking about the neighbor coming out. And Yeah, yeah, man. Misinformation is more dangerous than no information. Yeah, that was pretty... I mean, I, it's funny. I didn't remember that particular aspect of yeah. that. that foot yeah, what was the whole I know exactly story what you're talking about. So, dude, that was, uh, I don't know how he came to stop this guy. I think because we knew him. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember his name, man. I'm terrible with names. But other guys on the unit knew his name. And we went to stop this dude, and he took off running for whatever reason. And we ran all around that block like three or four times, man. He ended up discarding a large amount of weed. Um, I don't think he had a gun on him. Mm-hmm. There was some controlled substance. I remember we, we ended up charging him with a felony or whatever. Um, but he, he ended up running out into the street. And then uh, this old man, I'll call him, uh, I'll call him Mike, uh, <laughs> soon, to, soon to be retired guy. I remember him waving his baton in the air. Wait, like I thought a wizard. He, I thought he was like retired. Delivering these strikes. No, he's retired now. Okay. Yeah. yeah well, oh, yeah. At the time, he was retired. soon to be retired. Yeah, he was soon that was, to be retired. Yeah, that was the week he was retiring. Yep, because he, he, he like ended up hurting his leg or something. I don't yeah. know. It was funny. It was funny. That's what I remember about it. But no, that shit's real, man. I mean, you, you're you're fully aware. And I, I like to assume that everybody's got a gun, man. But like your story, and you kind of shared a, a, a touch of it mm-hmm. um, on one of your podcasts about the little fetish club or whatever you talked about, like where you went right and if you would have gone left, you know, yeah. it would have been a different story. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's after the fact when you get to think about stuff like that and you're like, ooh. That could have been. That well, could have been bad. Well, yeah, like, well, because like, 
It's also about different perspectives, too, because from my perspective, I was laughing because the way you sound on the radio, because you literally sounded like, oh, fuck, he has a gun. Yeah, like, who has a gun? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, but then, like, your side of it's like, oh, shit, it's actually a really serious situation. Oh, yeah, it changes it, man. It's, mm-hmm. um, and I was young then, you know, too. <laughs> so at that point in time, I'd been on. You were on CSU for a while at so that I didn't, time. I did, I guess, for, for, you know, the listeners or whatever, my, my career has consisted of two years on patrol. Mm-hmm. Two years on a crime suppression unit, which is a, a marked unit that doesn't respond to calls for service, but we would respond. Uh, we would work very targeted, high crime areas, yeah. the jump out boys, so to speak. You know, yeah. we, and we would go out there and seek out, do proactive police work. Just, just to clarify that um, for the audience, patrol is what you normally see. Um, the normal cop you will see, like you doing traffic stops. He's going to nine one one calls, doing. Prim, uh, the preliminary investigations and the CSU unit is more specialized. They are focused on certain tasks. Yeah, so we, we did that for two years, man. That was good. Hours were crazy, dude. Uh, every day, you, you didn't really quite know what you were working or what your days off were. You may come into work, work in one detail. Lieutenant may tell Sarge. Sarge may come break it to you. Hey, you guys go home because we're coming in in however many hours and our mm-hmm. hours are being shifted to this. So, uh yeah, we, we were all over the place. Um, so, yeah, two years patrol, two years as a crime suppression unit. Then I went to a, uh, a plainclothes unit and worked um, narcotics stuff. Oh, really? How did I know you uh, went? Yeah, I went over, oh, I went yeah, over there. I, I won't mention that. the name of the uh, of the agency. It's a separate, yeah, don't worry about that. Uh, but I, I went over there um, to this, we'll call it this, uh, it was like a multi-agency task force kind of thing. Yeah, there's specialized task yeah. force type. Did handles some, good part of Georgia. Yep, did some dope, did some dope stuff for uh, for three years, uh, just short of three years, and then came back to patrol. And I've been on patrol for a year. So why would you go back to my, patrol? That's my eight year thing. Well, uh, a lot of it was this deployment coming up, man. And I'd be oh, lying, okay. I'd be lying to myself and members of your audience if I said it was completely, uh, completely voluntary. The issue was, it is, is we were there and we're on a team. Mm-hmm. And it was really that team kind of environment, then uh, that tribalism yeah. in this in this plainclothes unit, and um, because of the military and going on leave to go into the field to do training to go to different schools or whatever to prepare for this upcoming deployment, um, I would uh, I was not able to take on the caseload for myself mm. that other members of the team were, so I wasn't able to make my own cases or work my own long-term or midterm kind of investigations. So a lot of those investigations are going three months to six months or whatever. Um, and I wasn't able to really do that because of these breaks that I was having to have uh, in, in work to go train with the military. And um, when I came in, I would try to, I would try to make up for it, you know, by helping other people with their cases and being where I could. But, it was really a detractor to that team and that unit. They couldn't get all the work out of me, or they weren't getting all the work out of me mm-hmm. um, that they really needed. And uh, so it was easier for them to send me back and to get somebody else that could really come in there and not be distracted with military stuff and just focus on doing dope work and putting bad guys in jail. So it's good and bad. Um, I gained invaluable experience there. We did crazy stuff. Yeah, that's it's a good, unreal. It's a good position. Yeah, it was it was amazing, amazing experience. Um, it's helped mold me into what I am today, and I'm a better patrol officer because of it. Um, I learned some stuff. I can come back and share with some younger guys on the on the watch, and you know, I think I think our watch is better for it as a whole. Yeah, of course. It kind of it kind of recentered me and brought me back to that core. Are you what back? It means man to be to be a cop. Mm-hmm. You know, to are be you in patrol? Are you back in Southside or are you? Uh, yeah, yeah, man, okay. back in uh, back in Southside. <laughs> Precinct four. <dude. laughs> yeah, yeah, like um, I think that's always a great asset. Like when you have um, guys coming back from specialized units, like detectives, violent crime detectives, narcotics, uh, narcotic units come back to patrol then you have all that knowledge with you too mm-hmm. that knowledge experience there's not much of that going on anymore man it's a shame most of the the knowledge and experience is tucked away and hidden spread out throughout the department and specialized units not on patrol mm-hmm. not being able to mentor these younger dudes and girls completely correct no no i say that man i just had a uh, i had a rookie ride with me i'm mm-hmm. a, uh, a training officer and i had a female riding with me uh, the past three weeks. So, 
but I'm you know able to share some of that some yeah. of that stuff. And there's there's not enough guys or girls with experience that are in patrol that are able to share that. And I, I wish we could fix that. Well, I'm bit. not sure. If that's just a um our former de- or my former department's problem, or that's a national problem too. Because I want to talk to you about this. A I, don't little know, bit. I don't know. I don't know if it, is. it. It could be. It could be some of both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably some of both. Because uh, it's been what is it? 2018. I quit. Yeah, it's almost nearly four years since I stopped being a cop. Um, has things got more challenging to be a police officer afterwards? Like not only with what was going on with our department with the corruption and stuff, but the whole national, like the whole national debate about police. But the Black Lives Matter, that kind of shit. Maybe. Uh, maybe. I don't sensationalize that quite as much as mm-hmm. other people. Um, I have not personally noticed a big issue okay. with it. Um, the, but that being said, where you and I worked, mm-hmm. um, I don't know, people were kind of like that anyway. Yeah. You know? And I'm no stranger to being called any number of names, you know, <laughs> yeah. or, or being accused of being racist or anything like that, or to have people. I mean, it, it really, it really hasn't changed uh, that much for me. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe there's more national attention in it. The problem with it is, is that be it uh, a cop who is hurt or killed, yeah, in the line of duty, or be it a a citizen who may have been unjustly hurt by the police mm-hmm. um, or, or killed or, or worse. Uh, both sides of that story are being kind of leveraged by different, I don't know if it's political agendas or what, but it's, it's, it's like there's this black and white divide. There's like two sides to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't know why that needs, I don't know why that needs to happen. I, it's, it's crazy, man. It's like people are, it's like you're either always going to side with the police or you're always going to side with, uh, you know, the, I guess the citizen or the suspect or whatever, and then say like, oh, the police are bad. I don't know why people can't take kind of more of an objective stance. Yeah, of course. You know, and then us as officers, we have to deal in objective. We have, we have to be as objective as we can, you know, kind of fact takers and like, let's wait and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you and I know there's three sides to every story. You know, there's, there's what one person says, there's what the other person says, and then there's <laughs> the what actually happened. <laughs> um, and that goes, that, you know, that, that transcends all different professions. But, um, yeah, man, it, it, there doesn't have to be this jump to conclusions. And I wish people would stop doing it. I wish we, we could wait. Let's get some facts. Let's make an educated decision and then form an opinion. Because I'll be the first person to tell you, man, when there's a shoot, you know, that you see a video of and you're like, oh, that's a, that's a bad shoot. You know? Yeah. Uh, or other ones when because of my training and experience, I can say, no, that's a good shoot because mm-hmm. of this. Because of this case law. Because of this Supreme Court decision. Because yep. these are... The circumstances, this is how that officer would articulate that, or this is why he did what he did. Whereas the layman doesn't and will never know or understand that. Right? Yeah, like um, like, like we were talking about earlier, I, I strongly believe people have to have to basically the capability, or, to, or if you want to use like a great, good analogy, the software for being intelligent, maybe intelligent. Mm-hmm. So I believe people are intelligent to a certain degree, but what I see in the news is like it's really painting against the police some a lot of times, and they're not t- not training people like, hey, you need to be objective, or you need the totality of the circumstances. You need to actually look at the whole picture. Okay, what was the cop? What was the cop saying? What happened before? What happened after? What was what was their environment like? There's so mm-hmm. many factors, especially with police shootings. Like, there's so many factors involved. It's not like a cop goes is. Before he gets to work, it's like, man, I'm just going to kill someone today. Right. It's not like that. It's like yep. there's so many factors involved. You'll, you'll occasionally get a guy on a news a news thing. You know, They'll have some expert that they'll bring in, and that person will try to convey that. Mm-hmm. People aren't listening to that guy. Man, they're watching the YouTube video, and they're automatically forming their opinions and biases. Maybe some of that's influenced by environmental conditions or their upbringing. And they really quickly put themselves on that on that black side or that white side. Not talking about a race, but just you know being black and white divided, no gray. They pick either left or right, which side they're going to be on, and that's where they're at. And it, it stinks, man, because you can't really explain it to people. 
Um, and when there's an opinion of like a grand jury that you know looks at an officer, should they bring the officer on charges or whatever, mm-hmm. and then they find the you know they, they give it like a, a no bill or whatever, you know they find the officer was justified in their use of force. Then there's you know sometimes there's like a civil unrest or like a protest or uprising, but there's no real good explanation of why. Mm-hmm. Also, when stuff happens real fast um, after an incident occurs. And like defense attorneys or the family of the victim or suspect or whatever is putting information out, the police department can't do that. You know, we can't do the what sometimes these news outlets do and just either be first or be right. Like we can't do that. You know, <laughs> yeah. They have to try to be objective. They they can only speak on what they can they can say. And any time that you see police departments that have accidentally or intentionally said something wrong, it always backfires on them. So. Defense attorneys can say like, oh, this, 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 and this. News agency will report all the defense attorneys making all these allegations. We called the police department and uh, they they didn't have any answer for us at this time. Yeah, the press officer didn't have an answer. It's like, well, what does that imply? You know, they're implying that, oh, the police are trying to hide something or they're 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 scared. It's like, no, man, we we just got to gather the facts. Yeah, a lot lot of times people forget, too, that this is not like law and order where you're going to have a – the evidence and the facts within an hour like yeah. the, it's it takes maybe weeks maybe months or even years to actually get the proper facts that's forensics that is eyewitnesses um it's all crazy. the factors yeah there's so many factors and look, look at look at uh i'll use this um in the michael brown shooting which one is kind of convoluted that was the ferguson it was the ferguson incident um, that mm-hmm. one, that one's kind of deep and I, w- I won't dig into it too much. I will mm-hmm. just say that like hands up, don't shoot, right? Hands up, don't shoot was born out of that thing. Yeah. Um, Michael Brown didn't have his hands up. You know what I mean? Like he, he, he never had the, he, he never had his hands up and well, they, they proved that forensically. They showed that, you know, how he was shot and where he was shot, like his hands could physically not have been up when he was shot and what he was doing when he was. I'm not going to say that he should or should not have been shot. I wasn't there. Um, I think that, uh, some stuff could have been different. Mm-hmm. Some stuff should have been different. There was um, some stuff that maybe that officer did uh, that put himself in a position to where he felt at that time he needed to shoot that guy to protect himself. Um, well, also it came out f- as a robbery, too. It came out of some different stuff. On the flip side, I'm not going to say that you're automatically wrong for shooting somebody that's unarmed. Mm-hmm. Uh, lots of police officers are killed by unarmed people. That's true. Um, lots of armed people are killed by unarmed people. It's... It's 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 too great, man. This 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 job is too convoluted to to you know. Yeah, my room my roommate Monday at the time quarterback everything. Yeah, my roommate at the time she uh she asked the question how come um the officer couldn't shoot him in the arm and leg. I had explained to her like it's not like it really is not like the movies or TV shows. You could still kill a person by shooting them in the leg. You could hit the artery or same thing mm-hmm. with arm. You could still kill him by shooting him in the arm. And also too guns. Are meant to kill, They're not, and also, with saying that, the officer has to worry about where the bullet's going. Oh, so certainly. if he, if you aim for the arm or the leg, that's a smaller target, tiny target. It's a tiny target, and you might he might hurt or kill someone behind him. That yeah, and then you're under stress. You're, you're talking about shooting and moving targets, man, and you get somebody out oh, there yeah, on the range, too. stress shooting, and, and then can you imagine like the stress that an officer would be in at that point in time, to where he thinks. That his life is in jeopardy, or her life is in jeopardy, and they have to pull out their gun and they have to use this deadly weapon mm-hmm. to prevent this act from happening. How much more stress they're going to be in, you know? Uh, and then you're talking about trying to shoot a small target that, that's moving and flailing around, arms or legs or whatever. Yeah, it's it's unrealistic, man. It's, that's that's a ridiculous proposition. Yeah. Um, well, she didn't. Well, the thing is, she didn't know any better. Well, most people don't. Yeah. yeah. Most people, it's honest. A lot of times, you can have good conversations with people. Um. And without picking a side, you can just, I wouldn't say, that, I don't even want to use the word educate because that sounds kind of condescending, but you could you could share knowledge with them and then maybe they could come to have a better understanding of. Yeah, you have some someone the, who's in the, the field, situation. like someone who has an experience in the field of it. It's like, this is why this doesn't happen or this is why it does happen. Mm-hmm. And you could explain it like, okay, this is the loss, this is the policy, this is the procedure, this is the training. And, Certainly, um, man. I know plenty of plenty of cops that were divided on uh, that shooting and, and some others. You know, mm-hmm. um, the well, thing that's crazy is there's no national database. There's no 
FBI uniform crime reporting statistics for the number of people that could have justifiably been shot by police that weren't. There's no way to I, track that. I, um, I mean, that can I, be easily tracked if you use um, the actual prosecution or the actual grand jury or, or what, what happened with the jury. Maybe, but like there's there's untold numbers of people that I could have justifiably used lethal force on mm-hmm. in my relatively short career that I didn't. I don't know why I did or I didn't, and I'm not sitting here saying that I'm right or wrong for doing it or not mm-hmm. doing it or making any kind of implication like that. But there's people that I could have shot yeah, um, that I did not shoot. There's- and uh, there's no way of knowing that. But for the number of people that are shot by police – Compared to the number of people that could be justifiably shot by police, mm-hmm. like the odds are against you getting shot by the police, you know, because oh. cops don't want to shoot anybody, man. No, like that's one thing I was happy with. One thing I could take away is like I never want to kill anyone while I was at work. Like I don't want to live mm-hmm. with. A, I know for a fact I will get some bad PTSD if I were to kill someone. I know that for a fact. If that were, well, I, say, I say that I say, say cops don't want to shoot anybody. If there's yeah. an active shooter going on, if there's something like that, if there's something yeah, if something of, like that, if you have to immediate threat, you know, uh, you know, like yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go in there, yeah, I'm gonna I'm, go find yeah. that guy, yeah, let me clarify. I'm going that. to stop him from doing what he's doing. Now, stopping him, I, I in stopping him, I may employ mm. a firearm to do so. That's different, you know. You don't go to work like, oh man, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna shoot some people, you know. Yeah, let me clarify that. I didn't, Nobody says. That. Yeah, I don't want to. No, I don't want to take joy of killing, but if something were to happen, if I had to take a life, then I'm like, okay, I fucking have to do it, and I have to live for that, but it was our duty. Like, okay, mm-hmm. this guy about to kill his wife with a knife, I shot him. This is just an example or a hypothetical. I have to do it because I have to protect her life. Mm-hmm. Her life is more viable at that point because he's trying to take her life. So, and it's something I, if that were to happen, I would have to live with it, but it's not something where... Every day, it's like, oh my, oh boy, I might shoot someone today. So yeah. what? It's not like that. Yeah, nobody. I, well, I'll say nobody. Um, I have not encountered that. There was one guy in my training class. I did. He did say out loud that he wanted to kill someone. And I was like, ooh. Hmm. I'm not sure if he's still working with the department. I think he quit a year into it. But uh, yeah, yeah. He, and usually those dudes, man, uh, in the military anyway, I've had experience with some of those guys. Usually those guys are trying to posture up a little bit you know Mm. they're trying to sometimes they're scared or they're intimidated by the job or situation and they're trying to compensate for that by trying to act all hard and gung-ho you know because there's no there's no place for that on the street man like you can't go out there trying to be trying to be hard you're gonna get yourself in trouble yeah but and you'll be found out real quick you know that you're soft (laughs) you're soft (laughs) what what's on the one thing I will admit, I'm not sure if you commented, it, but one thing I will admit, I do miss the foot chases. Oh, the foot chases are fun, man. <laughs> I mean, like, it, it, it is fun. Dude, I got, a, I got, a, I got a foot, it's funny you mentioned this, man. I, I got, I got in the foot chase two days ago. Yeah. Oh, um, it was, it was great. Uh, it was a good, it was a good chase, man, because the, uh, the bad guy went to jail. Mm-hmm. Um, no officers were hurt. Um, he had, he had committed a crime against another person. Yeah. Was it violent or? Yeah, well, to, okay, where, to where to where she was she was uh, she was injured, you know, without without talking about too okay. much about it. Okay, all right, but, that's uh, it. Yeah, a bad bad guy uh, did something to a female. She got hurt, and then he then he wanted to run away on foot, you know. And uh, good response by all officers involved. I ended up catching the guy, and he went to jail. So I mean, it was good. It was fun. And then later, you get to think about like, man, that Altima almost almost took us both out, you know. Or, <laughs> yeah. And I then there's the incident like when you when you when, when you catch the guy, you know, what are you going to do with him then? You know, like does he have weapons or whatever? You know. Dude, yeah. I've I've uh, chased plenty of guys that have decided to to throw guns instead of try to employ yeah. them against me. You know, I don't I don't know. I, that's what they'd be how often that for. happened with you, you know. But more people, luckily, knock on wood throw try to throw try to get rid of guns when they're running than, than if, or have tried to get rid of guns when they're running than have tried to use them on me so that's uh that's a relief or that's been a relief but that's always one of those things you think about when you're going to sleep that night like what if right there when it happens you're all high you know what i mean you're like oh man that's great you know adrenaline's pumping or whatever you caught the bad guy yeah your buddies are giving you high fives you know and then uh then later that night you're like man that dude had a gun like what if he would have wheeled around 
you know, and uh, taking a blind shot. Maybe he, got, maybe he gets lucky. You know, he's only got to be right once. Yep. I got to be right all the time. <laughs> all the time. So. Yeah. The, um, actually, there was one time, besides that time that you mentioned in that episode, there was a time where I nearly saw a guy in the head. I'm glad it didn't happen. Um, I'm not going to say his name on air. Me and him were cl- it was close to uh, um, the end of the shift. And we got a call. First, it came out as an unknown call. Dispatched it. Got a 911 call. She said something. She, she needs help, but she didn't give out addresses. She hung up. So we went to the area. And she came. it came in as a domestic. And this time, we had a, a apartment address. So me and the so the officer went to the went to the um, the apartment, and you know the whole policy: two officers for a domestic. You know, stay, domestics are a really dangerous uh, call because the oh, yeah. the wife or whoever called nine one one could easily turn on the police and try to kill them. This it's been documented that police do get killed during domestic disputes. Mm-hmm. So we get there, and we're at the time we we're just taking a normal knocking. I knocked on the door. And was about to, I'm just waiting for him to open the door, and then the, that's when the um, the chime came in. The, um, what do you call it? the tones? Yeah, the tones. Um, and for the people who no, don't know what tone is, the tone is a uh, signals a violent or a um, highly aggressive crime. Yeah, yeah, it'd be a, you know a robbery or a shooting, shooting or a homicide, something like that. Yeah, yeah. You, you get those. You know, your radios like beep, 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 beep. And that's to let officers know, like, yeah. hey, some real shit's coming on the radio. Shut up for a second. And you may, you may need backup. Be, be ready to get in your car and, and and make haste. Yeah, so, like, uh, when I knocked on the door, that's when the beeps came out. I thought something was happening in Precinct 5 or Precinct 3. And that's when <laughs> they said the address I was at in an apartment. And it's like a, a stabbing or something. Oh, so man. I was about, me and... Uh, the officer pulled out our guns. I was about to kick down the door, and the door swung open, and the guy came out with a knife, and I had my. For some reason, I was ta- he was crouched for some reason, mm-hmm. so I had, I was I was higher than him because I was standing straight up, and I just pointed my gun straight to his head. I'm like, dude, drop the fucking knife, and I thought, man, I don't, please don't let this happen. Please don't let this happen. And he dropped the knife. Turn out, it was a domestic. Simple battery at best. We at least at best it was a simple battery. Um, the guy just took the knife away from the girlfriend, and he came to the door when I knocked on the door, and she called when he took the knife away from her, saying like, "Yeah, he has a knife." So it's tough to get misconstrued like that, man. And uh, and luckily that guy made that decision. You yeah, know? it's like it could have been it could have easily gone the other way, and I'm glad of I'm totally glad it didn't happen. Yep. Yeah, stuff's crazy, man. You, know, you never know. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. That's the coolest thing about this job. You go to work, you make as much of a ritual out of everything as you can. You know what I mean? Like, when I'm getting ready for work, when I'm putting my uniform on, when I'm putting my vest on, when I'm strapping my gun belt on, doing press checks, making sure my gun's loaded, whatever. I'll do some draws out of the holster just so that <laughs> muscle draws, memory is the there. Muscle memory. Yeah. Um, I hate that. I hate that term, muscle memory. Muscles don't have memory, but just to make sure that 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 subconscious, the or that, that drawing that gun is in my subconscious, because when I need it, I don't. I don't have time to think. Yeah, when I'm when I'm prepping, man, when I'm getting ready, um, all that stuff's ritual. When I drive to work, when I'm putting my my mind, you know, where I'm at in my head, because uh, when I hit in service and on that MDT and drive out there, who knows what the hell is going to happen? Mm-hmm. You know, it's crazy, man. Every day's different. Did you ever carry a backup gun? Yeah, I carried. Um, I had a couple of different guns. I'd carry. I carry either a thirty-eight revolver or oh, a, little, yeah. a little three eighty, <laughs> uh, a little three eighty LCP. Either um, on an ankle or sometimes in the pocket on my, uh, my weak side or support side mm-hmm. front pocket. When I was working CSU, we had the you know cargo pants. It was easier to get your hand yeah, out of your pocket. Yeah, a lot more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, so you could, uh, could reach in there and get that thing. But um, luckily, never had to use any <laughs> any of my firearms at work. Yeah, I carried. Apart uh, from shooting deer, I had to dispatch a few deer. That <laughs> hit my deer. Car, so. I'm good with that, man. I shoot deer. <laughs> I shoot deer anyway. Oh yeah, like I got my got my hunting license for Florida. Not the hunt, a hunting permit for Florida. Yeah, I really want to go on hunt. I got myself a uh, 
Actually, I traded in my um, backup gun. I had a Glock 30. I nice kept gun. it. Yeah, I kept it underneath. Uh, I kept it in my uh, vest, my bullet, bullet resistant vest, underneath my armpit. So it was kind of like a cross draw shoulder holster mm-hmm. in a way. Well, I traded in for a Marlin uh, 3030. Oh, nice, dude. 3030 will put a put a white tail down pretty good, man. Yeah, I wanted I wanted a, on a rifle that was like all around. Like, okay. I'm, because I haven't gone hunting yet. I'm still looking for someone to take me. Because I want to go someone that's experienced. Mm-hmm. But I thought, like, I would deer first a boar. Because I tried wild boar before. I'm like, man, that's actually pretty good meat. Yeah, so I don't, I'm not, I'm not versed in the the, the pig hunting uh, and uh, and how to prep that and, and cook it or whatever. Mm-hmm. Deer, on the other hand, I am. And it's good, man. There's something, there's something primal about it. People will be, uh, judgmental i guess you know and they're like how do you how can you shoot bambi or how can you do this or whatever you know and, and there's more power in you a cousin once told me she's like there's on the facebook she says uh, she says she says there's more power in you uh there's more strength in you than a high-powered rifle or something like that and i think i replied like as opposed to a low-powered one like i don't understand no what you're, i don't understand what you're trying to say here lady you know and i think she was upset talking about like you know i shot this deer it's like look more than 200 We'll say 200 plus deer pass in front of my stand this season. I shot this one, you know, I picked mm-hmm. this one. It's like, I know more about, and I spend more time watching and observing that this animal, animal. Mm-hmm. than that person ever will, that critic of mine ever will. And I appreciate this animal more. That's not even taking into account the fact that deer are a prey species. Mm-hmm. Man has come in great numbers, humans, mm-hmm. To North America, to this continent, and have removed natural predators of deer, and deer have thrived in suburban areas. There's more deer now uh, in North America than there were when Christopher Columbus landed on this motherfucker. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, there's the, and they're the number one cause of property damage in the United States. Yeah, especially. And I think a pigs vehicle. are number two. Yeah, it's outrageous, man. And so you you can you can take the you can do like uh, we have out here on you know some of these islands. Where there's no hunting, but there's so many deer, and they're they're just taken over. Where you have the Department of Natural Resources has to come out with suppressed weapons and, and kill these deer just to thin the herd, or you have places at parks and stuff in New York and other areas where they're coming out tranquilizing the deer and then like sterilizing them and then re-releasing them. Mm-hmm. It's like, or you can let people go hunt them and eat them or and, the, and enjoy them. You get know? the meat to uh. The homeless shelters. Yeah, donate. That's there's a good there's meat. several programs um, here in, in Georgia that do stuff like that, man, mm-hmm. and it's uh, it's the best thing. And, and if you look at the numbers, man, taxes, uh, excise taxes on firearms, ammunition, hunting license, camouflage, yeah. whatever, and then donations by sportsmen <laughs> or, or in quote, air quotes or uh, or hunters um, contributes way more money to like wildlife conservation and preservation. Than PETA or any of that shit. Yeah, not a lot of people know about that. I didn't know about that until I took that. Um, I'm not a fan of NRA, but it had a great course for the. It was a free course at Florida. For Florida, you could do it for free with the NRA. It was like an online course that teaches you like a hunting. Um, like a hunter safety. Yeah, hunter classroom. safety stuff, the laws and stuff. It was actually a really great course. And um, I forgot the name of the law. It was passed by Congress. But basically, there's a tax on anything that you bought for hunting, mm-hmm. and that goes back to the wildlife for America. So yep. a lot of the preservation you see on for wildlife across the United States is not, not coming from the Parks Department. It's coming from the taxes that's collected from the hunters. Some of these states, man, like if you look at like Montana or whatever, where they have different big game hunts, and you have a lot of people that are coming from out of state, you know, and they're selling tags for these animals for out of state. And, they, and the, these states, dude, they, they're pretty... They pretty heavily track the population of the animals that are in their state, uh, and they try to manage those populations by how many tags that they issue every mm-hmm. year, and and all this other stuff that they try to do to keep track of the stuff and, and you know herd management and stuff. I mean, it's a science, and I'm not going to sit here and act like I know <laughs> how the hell all this shit works, man. I just know that they they are meticulous about it, and it's not a couple of rednecks being like, oh shit, you know, well we need some money, <laughs> let's sell this many tags. Like, no, there's, money. <laughs> there's a legit science to it, man, but they're making some good money off of that, and they turn around and they put it right back into, right back into, into that animal and, and conserving that, that game species and mm-hmm. keeping it thriving. And other species, too, that so might not be yes, a game. So that, so that, you know, people can come there and hunt it, or maybe they take money that they make from people coming there and hunting some, some game species, 
and they take that and they use it to protect some endangered species. Yeah, that's where all that money comes from. Yep. It's, um, I mean, it's a great little law. I think it's actually a lot of countries from the, other countries from across the world actually admire that type of law. Like, all right, that's, there's money going back into it. Yeah, yeah, and these other countries hunt too, you know, like Germany, they hunt, Japan, they hunt deer. I mean, Mm. everybody thinks of these, you know, America's the only people with guns that are going around hunting, but hunting is... No, hunting like, is everywhere, and it can be done right and wrong. That's how um, we survive. Survive as a people. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, there's right and wrong ways to do it, man. I just and if somebody doesn't like hunting mm-hmm. because they personally don't like the idea of it, they don't think that they could sit in the stand, or they don't think they could stalk an animal and then shoot it mm-hmm. or trap it or whatever and kill an animal and eat it, or maybe they're vegan, whatever. Cool, um, but if you're going to tell me that I'm wrong, at least understand everything surrounding that you know what i mean have make an educated decision mm-hmm. i hate jumping to conclusions in in having an opinion on something when i don't know and i'll tell people all the time man i'll have some buddies you know because i usually stay up on current events or whatever and mm-hmm. they'll say hey well how about so and so or what do you think about this guy that's running for this office or what about this law or this situation i'll be like man i don't, I don't have an opinion it's like i've seen the youtube video that you've seen Mm. I've seen these Facebook posts that are going around that are viral that you've Facebook seen, you know, <laughs> but I haven't read into it. I don't know enough about it to have a, a, a friggin' opinion on this thing, you know, and I want to be, I want to have thought about something before I yeah, influence somebody else with well, an opinion. We were talking about bias or biases too. Um, actually before I actually started getting interested in hunting and investing into it, uh, I was against it. Honestly, I, was, I thought like, because coming from my point of view, when I saw in the news a lot of times, it was um, these game hunters that were hunting like these rare endangered animals. Mm-hmm. So I had like a really bad bias towards that. Like, why would you kill like a majestic lion? Until later, I find out like actually killing those lions might be a good thing because a lot of those lions killed the villagers back in Africa, or killed the herds, or actually killed the villagers. Yeah, or they're or they're or they're killing the. Uh the cubs or whatever you know mm-hmm. what i mean um there's weird stuff with that so that's funny the cecil the lion thing right that happened not too long ago <laughs> so I'll, I'll say this man i don't like trophy hunting yeah there we go trophy hunting um, i don't like trophy hunting at all I, I hunt to eat i don't buy ground beef i don't mm. buy beef at all i eat venison all year round oh, that sounds good. um I, I i go on my family's land we try our best um with the size the amount of land that we have to manage our herd of deer and then we're pretty selective about what we shoot I've um, been hunting every year since I've been back from Afghanistan. I've shot two bucks in the past mm. nine years, uh, eight years, sorry. Um, you know, a lot of what I've shot has been has been does. Um, but I'm not out there chasing antlers, you know what I mean? Like, that's not what I'm trying to do. We're trying to, you know, cull certain deer from the herd that's there or if there's a, a – uh, and, then, and then shoot to eat, you know what I mean? We're not, we're not shooting to put something on the wall. Um, and so I don't understand, I don't, I don't like trophy hunting. Uh-uh. So for example, a lion, and I may be wrong, but I don't think people eat friggin' lions. Um, I don't know that they do. I know that in the, some of those countries in Africa, when they shoot like an elephant, uh-huh. um, that it's usually donated and the people eat it. That's a lot of meat. Uh, yeah, a lot, a of, meat. lot of meat. And I've seen some of those, those, uh, shows or whatever, where you see the, the villagers coming out and they're actually harvesting this elephant, cutting it up and quartering mm-hmm. it or whatever. So that's cool. I get that. And I know that they have to do herd management there too mm-hmm. um, because they're trying to create these 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 areas where these animals can thrive. Um, and maybe they're having issues with overpopulation, with inbreeding, with disease. Maybe they're, there's a drought that year and they're running out of food and they're trying to manage this, this herd. I get it. Uh, and if that place in that third world country that has been oppressed for other reasons can make money – off of some rich white guy that wants to fly to Africa to shoot this friggin' elephant, and they can take that money and then turn, pour it back into the conservation of this species long term. I'm 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 okay with that. What I don't understand is that rich white guy who wants to spend all this money to fly to Africa to shoot an elephant. Mm. That he's not going to eat. Yeah. I don't I don't get that. I don't understand that. So I'm 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 mixed. I've mixed opinion. A mixed opinion on that kind of that kind of stuff. I do understand why some lions or some elephants or some whatever in these herds, these managed population of animals, have to be or need to be called out. They need to be killed. They need mm-hmm. to be removed. Um, but on the same token, I I don't 
I can't align myself with or understand the mindset of that dude that's going over there to shoot this thing. Yeah, it's to, like... Like, I don't get gratification out of shooting it. It's not... If you got the money, just go buy yourself a Ferrari or a Tesla or something. <laughs> yeah, let's like, go buy... Don't, don't fucking use like it. Like, shooting, 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 shooting the animal does nothing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, eating the animal does. Yeah, and like... If that dude's not f- freezing this friggin' elephant, and I, you know, cool on him for donating him, right? Mm-hmm. We'll stick with lions. We'll stick with lions because it makes the it makes the discussion simpler. Like I don't think anybody's eating this lion, and it it wouldn't make my dick any bigger to have a fucking stuffed lion in my living room. You know what I mean? In fact, I would feel <laughs> I would feel bad, dude. We were at the zoo. We were at the zoo last weekend. We went to the zoo in Columbia with my kids. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at this friggin' tiger, man. I think of this tiger there. This thing is like lethargic and it's oh. like really skinny, and it just—it actually hurt my feelings, man. It made me want to leave the friggin' zoo, and I, I fucking hate zoos because you see it in cats. You see it in cats a lot, man, where they got this this little track. They walk around the fence, you know, and their mind starts going away, um, and, and it always seems more prominent in, in big cats. And uh, I hate seeing it, dude. I saw this—I saw this tiger, and I was like, man, somebody needs to put this thing out of its misery. Like this is horrible. Like, cool for seeing a tiger and being able to point to my two-year-old little girl like, hey, that's a tiger, you know? Like, that's cool. But then I'm seeing it in the physical state that it's in, and it it made me feel terrible. Yeah, it's like a – one thing I, I, I say to people, like, I would never own a pet bird because I feel like it's a sin. Because birds got a great freaking ability to fly. That's a mm-hmm. ability that man has tried for hundreds of years to, to attain. They have it naturally. I think it's a sin to put them in a cage. Yeah, or clip their wings or whatever. Or, or if you look at these damn, uh, you ever watching these bird rescue shows where they where they mm, got no. like they got like pet pet like friggin' uh, I wouldn't say toucans. It's, it's usually parrots and shit like mm-hmm. that. Like maybe they got like an African gray or whatever. Yeah, <clears throat> you know these really really smart, these incredibly intelligent animals. But those animals like they like imprint or whatever on a human, and so their owner that's like their that's like their their shit. Yeah. And then if, if the owner has to sell the bird for whatever reason, or if the owner dies and the bird is then handed down to another family member that doesn't like the bird or maybe mm. can't take care of it. But the birds like turn to like self-mutilation and all kind of stuff, man. What? Yeah, they become super depressed. They start oh, picking man, their feathers sad. out and all kind of stuff. They're super susceptible. They're super smart, but they're super susceptible to like all these issues that humans have, you know what I mean? <laughs> to like depression and stuff like that. It's And it's it's weird seeing it in an animal. So yeah, I can I can... Can, uh, I can relate to that. Yeah, like um, there's a lot of animals that have the same mental issues, same emotions as humans. One of the most common ones is dogs. Like dogs do go to depression, they get anxiety, they get... I think some of them got like, diagnosed with ADHD, which is overdiagnosed with <laughs> humans. So why not go to oh, dogs? Yeah, but like dogs, um, oh, they feel the same stuff that we feel. Yeah, I man, anybody says that animals don't feel shit like... They're, they're, they're dumb, I, I read a uh, a cool article because uh, I'm starting to get into more art, like reading more about octopuses lately or cephalopods. Those a- those animals are freaking smart, and they actually I read somewhere that scientists like this is like legit scientists, it's not like these weird no one's ever heard of scientists, like <laughs> the crazy scientists. Like legit scientists are starting to believe like they might actually be they actually might have been aliens, like or they might have, they might have come from a different planet and came came to earth because something with the rna that they could actually control their there's dna and rna and i forgot the difference but the rna they could actually control and a lot of a lot of the abilities of a octopus or a cephalopod they're close to humans when it comes to problem solving they're extremely intelligent they're the way they camouflage. They not only they could change their color to the environment, but the texture too of their skin. Mm-hmm. Like they're amazing animals. We actually started looking into them. And I forgot where I was going with this, but, <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, like um. Anyway, but back to that study. They gave <laughs> they gave octopus because octopuses are loners. They they can't be with groups or tribes because they'll kill each other. Um. They gave the octopuses. A controlled dose of uh, ecstasy, and with ecstasy, ecstasy with uh, humans, it makes you. I never tried that one before, but ecstasy is supposed to make you um, kind of more loving, more grope, like you want to yeah, be yeah. more sociable, and made octopuses more the same same symptoms uh, you will see in human. The octopuses 
bit too. They start touching the octopus, start examining it, and they're not sure if it's being so sore or they're just. just what like, if it's some of this, that, that feel sensation? Because you yeah, see, that feels like they're not sure what it is yet, but they're like, this is kind of interesting. Yeah, like yeah. they're they're reacting in kind of the same way with, as humans. It's interesting, man. Yeah, I don't know. I never used ecstasy myself either, but you know, I obviously encountered it working narcotics and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and have been to some schools and learned some stuff about it. And it's kind of neat the way it's manipulating. Um, you know, different uh, different chemicals and stuff in the brain and the way your body perceives stuff or whatever. It's weird doing it with octopus and seeing what they're about. But uh. Yeah, well, like I, what I read was a scientist found like there's a protein that oct- octopus has, the same protein as a human has. So, mm-hmm. so they just thought like, okay, let's experiment. Let's, let's see, see what, what happens. happens. Yeah, well, it, I've seen those octopus fucking like breaking out of their cages and going oh, over yeah. to like where they keep their... Sorry, that's my... Uh... It's my neighbor's kids trying to play with my kids that aren't okay. here. <laughs> Hopefully they'll leave. They'll ring the doorbell and knock three more times and then they'll leave. Uh, but yeah, I've seen them like letting themselves out of their damn tank and like crawling across, you know, the, the room or whatever and getting into where they keep the uh, the food, you know, the whatever live fish or whatever they feed octopuses, mm-hmm. eating all that shit and coming back. Like, I've seen some of those videos. Well, like, have you, seen a, cool. have you seen a video of them? Or a beer? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll say this while you're getting a beer. There's a video on YouTube where they put an octopus into a, like a mason jar or just a jar with a um, a lid on it, and they screw the lid on. And if you watch the video, as soon as the, the the hand leaves the jar, the octopus knows what to do and unscrews the lid himself and gets out of the jar. Yeah, I'm fucking at, crazy. There goes the doorbell. <laughs> yeah, just to let you guys know, I do these interviews either where I live or I go to the person's house, so mobile. Yeah, we are we are in uh, we are in Drew's house right now. I have a, just just to let you guys know, Drew got a nice. I never heard his whiskey. Killing me. <laughs> you talk about the whiskey. I'm going to tell the kids to All me. Right. Yeah, Drew got this nice brand of whiskey called Eagle Wear. It's called well, it's called Eagle Wear, rare, and it's Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. But it's really good shit, and he's drinking. Shit that he's a cop, but it's not, there's no cannabis in it, thankfully, but it's called Sweetwater 420 Strain IPA. I tried it a little bit. I'm not a beer drinker, but that beer actually tastes pretty good. And this is, this is someone who doesn't like beer. I tried a little bit of it. And plus, it smells like marijuana. Yeah, this beer's crazy. <laughs> so just so, just so people know, there's no marijuana in yeah, this beer. No, it's got this, uh, this it, hemp stuff going on. Yeah, it's made it. with hemp. No, no THC, but it just gives this flavor. It's kind of wild. It smells. It smells good. It smells like marijuana, but like I, it doesn't taste like it though. Let's. Uh, we, you want you want to talk about marijuana real quick? Okay. While we're on this talking about police stuff, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's go for it. it. So marijuana, man. I've listened to some of your podcasts. Heard you started kind of experiment with it. I guess mm-hmm. uh, or not experiment with, it, but using it kind of recreationally. So people ask me about this all the freaking time, man. I know they used to bug you about it too. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a marijuana story. Deep home, did you ever smoke one or did you just I did I have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I smoked back, uh, back in the day. I smoked marijuana twice on two occasions. Mm-hmm. Um when I was thirteen mm-hmm. and when I was seventeen. Okay. And I'll tell the story about both. Um so when I was thirteen, man, I, I lived in uh Arizona. My dad was in the Air Force. We were at Luke Air Force Base, Glendale, Arizona. I was thirteen years old, man. This has got to be like fucking illegal or something. But I was, I was working. <laughs> yeah, of I was course. Working at, uh, no, no, not the weed thing, man. I, I was working at the commissary mm-hmm. on post during the day because you know I was homeschooled and shit. And um, there were these other these teenagers that were there, you know, uh, during the summer and stuff. And, and we were bagging groceries and pushing carts. I started off pushing carts. And I think I was making like minimum wage or maybe I was making like $5 under the table. I don't know, dude. I don't even recall. But then when you're bagging groceries, we made, I think we made like straight tips, man. We didn't get paid at all. And so what you would do, it was a couple of these teenagers and then it was me, you know, this, this 13 year old, 12, 13 year old you know, punk ass kid. And then it was a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of these uh, Korean ladies. So a lot of these Air Force retirees, they had gone to Korea, done their tour of duty in Korea married Korean women, mm. brought them back to the to the States. Yeah. And they in turn went and worked at the commissary. <laughs> and so what you would do, you, you would do what was called following people. So let's say there's register 12. There's, let's say Sue is on register 12. Um, I would come up, I'd be like, hey, can I follow you? She's like, yeah. So what that means is you help her bag the groceries. Mm-hmm. She then takes the groceries out. 
And whatever tip she receives, or whatever tip they get in the little tip box or the little box where they mm-hmm. hand her at the thing is hers. And then you get the next one. Oh, okay. The next customer. So we would do that. We'd make tips, man, make money and change or whatever. Again, that's got to be against some kind of labor law, dude. I was 12 and 13 doing this stuff in the heat, in, in, in the summer in Phoenix, Arizona. Bro, that gives you integrity. That's all. Yeah, it was crazy, right? So I had this dude. Uh, his name was Jeremy, man. Hmm. I remember this guy. He used to wear an AFI hat. And at the time, I didn't know what the band, who the band AFI was. Started liking them later <laughs> in life. But um, they went out there like, hey, man, we're going to go. We're going to smoke some weed, you know. And I was like, oh, you know, I'll be fucking rebellious, right? Let's go smoke weed. And I was skateboarding and stuff at the time. So we grabbed our skateboards, we jumped in somebody's like minivan or something they borrowed from their dad, and we all drove off to this new construction site. And uh, somebody pulled out a joint, passed it around, smoked it, I'm coughing to death. Um, they had to teach me how to inhale, because I didn't know how to do it. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah. I, and then I, just, I just, one, I thought it smelled horrible, mm-hmm. burning marijuana. I still think burnt marijuana smells awful mm-hmm. to this day. Um, we... Uh, all I did was think everything was funny and like my, my, my balance and my <laughs> yeah. like proprioception, kinesthetic awareness was bad because I was skateboarding and I couldn't do some of the tricks that I could normally do. Like I was just, cause I was high mm-hmm. and, um, and my first high, which is probably pretty, you know, pretty high compared to subsequent highs. Um, <laughs> and it, it didn't seem worth it, man. And I don't know if it was guilty conscience or what, or my dad pressured me. Like I didn't go home smelling like weed or anything like that, but my dad, I ended up telling my dad, and my dad told me, man, he said, uh, he said, you're weak, you're weak minded. Mm -hmm. I was like, nah, man, I'm not weak minded. You know, like I did this for me. Like I just wanted, he's like, it's not peer pressure. I just wanted to know what it's about. He's like, you're weak minded. So you couldn't, you couldn't know that that's there and have an understanding of what it does. And then, and then decide for yourself that you don't need that, that you're, you're, you're strong enough without it, you know? And whether or not my dad was right or wrong or whatever, or what anybody's personal opinions are on marijuana or any like mind altering substance, you know what I mean? Um, or drug. He told me that and that, that stuck with me, man. That stuck with me pretty hard. And it's, it's become more significant later in my life than it was then. Um, that was my, that was my experience with weed. And then, oh, 17, I was at a party, uh, with some people. Can't remember if I joined the military yet or not. We were at a lake house Second time I ever drank alcohol, I think. <laughs> um, second or third time. This dude that's there who I don't know, he was talking about, uh, you know, he had some weed or whatever, and he had, a, <clears throat> he had this thing he breaks out. He's like, it's a dugout. I'm like, what the fuck is a dugout, right? And it's like this it's like this porcelain pipe that looks like a cigarette. Like mm. it's painted up to look like a cigarette. Oh, like okay. It looks like it has a filter, you know what I mean? And he, he, put some, he put some marijuana in it. You'd hold a lighter up to it, and you'd try to like, inhale the fire into the marijuana burn it or whatever i was like dude i don't know how this fucking thing works man and i'm, I'm kind of kind of intoxicated right now so to be honest with you man i don't even know if i actually inhaled any marijuana <laughs> smoke. i don't even know if i actually inhaled any marijuana smoke that, that night or not man but i put it on my polygraph packet <laughs> talked about it during my polygraph so well like i i've been honest about it. it's the only two times i've ever messed with anything like that What's your thoughts on it now? So I'm, I'm glad people are moving away from hiding behind the medical marijuana bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I'll call it bullshit, dude, because I think that shit is a scam. Well, like, I think T- th- THC does nothing mm-hmm. for fucking fighting cancer cells or any of this other shit that's purported to happen, you know, that, that marijuana is supposed to do. Um, it's all the CBDs, right? And they can synth- yeah, synthesize CBDs. Com- com- and- Commandable. <clears throat> I don't even know how to fucking say it, but you <laughs> yes, know, uh, but you got THC, you know, tetrahydrocannabinol or whatever, like, I don't know, weed stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you look at weed now and you look at weed that people are buying and, you know, whatever purple haze or Hindu kush or whatever loud or, <laughs> or dank ass tree that they're buying from wherever, this stuff and these strains have been manipulated to where they're super high in THC and the, yeah, and the CBDs, the things that people mm-hmm. purport are actually helping medical things are low. So what they want is that psychedelic effect that they get from THC. So they want to get high. Mm-hmm. So stop bullshitting me about like, oh, you want to fucking, you know, it's like, no, you want to get high, man. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that there's not legitimate medical uses mm-hmm. for some of the compounds found in cannabis sativa, right? Like I'm not saying that that's not the case. But by and large, 
in my experience and from what I've seen, people are wanting to smoke weed to get, get high. To get weed. Yeah, get this guy high. Just want to get high, man. Just just talk about talk, talk about decriminalization. Mm-hmm. Talk about recreational use. Yeah, let's be honest about it. Uh, quit out mind the medical stuff, man. I watched a thing on Vice News, dude. I don't like the I don't like the rep Vice News because some of their shit's whack. But uh, <laughs> yeah, this, some, of um, <laughs> some of it's extreme, man. Some of it's some of it's fantastic. yeah. Some of it's really See, yeah. Some of it's like oh wow, that's actually pretty. Dude, good there's stuff important. on like the Ukrainian, like the conflict in the Ukraine, man. Was was, was freaking phenomenal. I saw the dude. North Korea shit. The North Korea shit was actually yeah. They've had some good, intense. They've had some good stuff, but um, they had this they had this kid, man. And they're showing this kid. This kid's like five or six, little girl. And she's suffering from, like, really, really extreme, some kind of disorder that they're trying to treat with marijuana. Mm-hmm. And so she, the kid obviously can't smoke marijuana, right? And one, if you smoke anything, it obviously, it, it immediately, I shouldn't say obviously, through through my research and some college papers and stuff that I've written, like, it negates any perceived medical benefit of it. Like, the act of smoking anything Really? Is worse for you than yeah, any benefit you would the receive carbon from the monoxide. Thing. It's fucking terrible. Yeah, it's like smoking smoke. is not the right way to do it. Mm-hmm. If you're able to like remove oil from it, and then that's able to you know be made into a pill form, or you ingest it, or whatever, any of those means are are better for absorbing these mm-hmm. compounds than smoking it. But um, so the kid couldn't smoke this stuff, so they were they were getting like a THC, and they were putting it in like brownies. Uh, you know, they're getting the THC oil. Mm-hmm these different extraction methods. They're putting it in brownies. They're making sugars out of it. I mean, uh, you know, sugary sweets out of it and stuff like that. This kid's taking heinous amounts of stuff, man. It would be like taking like an ounce and a half to two ounces, if I remember correctly, of some really strong, really just loud weed and then and then smoking it. Well, since, so th- this kid's having like, she's like tripping balls on weed, man, on THC because mm-hmm. she's getting huge, huge amounts of it because they're not using... Well, one, there's there's no way of knowing what what weed you're yeah, getting. You know, you know what I mean? Now. When you go to the store to buy medical marijuana in in fucking Colorado or wherever they were, you know, you're not buying like, oh, this is this, this is you know, mm-hmm. whatever brand pharmaceutical grade marijuana. This is the CBD. This is the THC. This is whatever. This is the strain that it's from. No, you're getting uh, you're getting like uh. You know, some dank-ass purple haze. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't know what the fuck this is. And and just to clarify something, too. um, Smoking marijuana and eating marijuana is two different highs. Coming from experience and coming from the research so far, but for my my part, I I smoke weed. Yeah, you still got high, but if you were to eat it, it's a lot harder stronger it's really it's mm-hmm. a stronger high well this kid in, the, in this video you know and again this is it's probably been manipulated or whatever mm-hmm. but the video was kind of a pro pro weed mm-hmm. pro mar- mar- medical marijuana or pro recreational marijuana kind of deal but it was disturbing man it was disturbing to see this kid like tripping and to see the yeah, amount to see the amount of thc that uh that she was getting and her parents are administering it to her you know what i mean so she's she can't make decisions for herself she's like a mm-hmm. kid that that messed me up a little bit, man. So I'm not sure with that. That being said, too, um, every every search warrant for major um, major drugs yeah. that I've ever partaken in, or any case that I've ever made, marijuana was also present. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I don't know where it's at. Were it legalized tomorrow? One, I wouldn't be able to use it. That's true. You know? But let's say let's say I wasn't a cop or I wasn't in the military because you know Canadian military just made it where they're pretty sure anyway that their armed forces can use or maybe can be prescribed medical marijuana now yeah they legalized it in canada across across the whole country but i didn't know about that part yeah, i think, I think their part. military members can now use it. there was something i saw in army times about that but um anyway i would not be able to use it let's say i did a job where i where i could if mm-hmm. it was legal let's say recreational marijuana is legal which where i work now they just passed a city ordinance not decriminalizing misdemeanor amounts of marijuana but creating it to where it's like a city ordinance citation as fine. opposed to an arrest. And I got opinions on that and, and where that actually came from, the spirit of that law, but I won't get into that. Okay. Um, I'll just say, I were I allowed to use it, I would not. Um, I don't like mind-altering stuff. And I know that sounds weird because I'm sitting here... And, Drinking and, a beer. Got the, got the, <laughs> the drug of alcohol right here, which, which um, depending on who you ask and what research you do is done way more to hurt people than marijuana ever has yeah, or ever course. will um, but I don't get drunk I don't even like being buzzed 
I'm gonna drink small amounts of beer. I drink craft beer. I like mm-hmm. the way it tastes. I kind of it's a hobby of mine, but I don't. Yeah, I love whiskey. I don't get drunk, man. I've been <laughs> drunk about five times in my life. Really? Yeah, man. Oh shit! That's... Don't like don't like getting drunk. <laughs> the, the only thing that I've started to mess with now, as far as some kind of mind altering or like euphoric state that's brought on by something else, is is fucking running, dude. Yeah, you got runner's I've gotten, high. I've gotten addicted to running, man. That runner's high is no shit. Now, it took me a long time to figure this out, dude. I've been in the military, got my break, dude, for over 12 years. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of running, and it sucked all the time, man. Only recently have I gotten to where I can really break into this thing, and I'm like, man, this is, this is where it's at, dude. And I don't know, you get to that point where shit hurts, and like your brain's not like, release some dopamine, this shit hurts, we got to cover this up. I don't know what it is, man, but it feels good. Yeah, I think it's the... I'm probably wrong about this. Is it's both the endorphins and the dopamines, and one of those I forgot if it's dopamine is similar to uh, opiates. Yeah, same, yeah, same think, receptors. Same yeah, receptors. I think that's actually. You know, I'm, I'm talking out of line here. You know, because I don't, I don't use uh, opiates, but yeah, those things uh, cause your body to release those Stress natural those natural chemicals pain, or whatever. Pain stop, uh, stops the pain. Um, yeah, it does that, man. It, it burns cortisol. You know, stress right. gets rid of stress and makes makes the world better. It keeps me skinny. Mm-hmm. Lost a lot of weight. <laughs> I'm down like 38 well, you, pounds. When I saw you, for, I thought you always looked the same. You, you were always um, in shape. Yeah, I was always, t- you know, kind of tall, kind of lean. But yeah, I got up, I was around about 205 and I'm walking in about... Yeah, yeah, I, never, uh, I never thought you'd be that, that much. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm floating around 168, 170 right oh. now, man. It's the smallest and uh, <laughs> or the, the leanest and uh, most in shape as far as running anyway I've ever been. Not the strongest. I, I, I've been stronger before, but... I'm liking it. It's the, the new, the new me. Yeah, I don't like uh, I don't like stuff that messes with my mind, man. I don't like stuff that influences me one way or the other. Um, and 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 weed does, man. And, mm-hmm. and anybody that says it doesn't is is full of shit, dude. Well, I uh, think you interview people, you deal with people that are high on the street, you know. Mm, yeah. And uh, I'd rather deal with someone that's high than someone that's drunk. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> people, people that are high are usually more cooperative. You know, yeah, they're they're, high on weed, high, high on marijuana. Yeah, like they're um, one thing I tell people too. It's like the same is you said exactly. Like I'd rather deal with someone that's high on marijuana than drunk, because alcohol makes you uh, it stops your inhib- inhibitions. Yep. Basically, that that voice in your head that tells you don't do it mm-hmm. because you could go to jail or you know lose your job. That voice is just quiet. Yep. And um. A lot of violence comes with alcohol with being drunk, but with weed, I'd rather deal with someone else high on weed because you could talk to them like, okay, no, I'm just gonna. They might be annoying, but not, they're not gonna be combative. Typically not, no. Yeah. And yeah, you can deal with them, or maybe they'll be like really cooperative. Yeah. Like, yeah, you can, you know, search but, my car. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Of course, if I, if I, if I smell <laughs> weed, I don't, I don't need the permission to search my car, but uh, or search their car. But uh, drug people suck, dude. And I learned that working this job and festivals and. Special events downtown and stuff Same. and bars. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't, I have no desire. That whole drunk scene. And so I missed it, man. I guess. So I was homeschooled. Mm-hmm. And my dad didn't really drink. Occasionally, he would have like a honey brown or something if we were out with like uh, some of his brothers and stuff. I remember a time when we went to uh, the Outback Steakhouse and one of my uncles had like a uh, this honey brown. What's a honey beer. brown? It's like this... Uh, I don't even know what the fuck it is, man. It's like it's like some kind of ale, some kind of like a. It's like a hot toddy. Is no, 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 no. It's it's like this 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 apple juice flavored. It's like a brown ale. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's like is it close to cider? Or something? Cra- yeah, let's say it's like a cider kind mm-hmm. of thing, right? It's like a crafty beer before it's crafty beer. I, I feel bad because I'm kind of a beer aficionado. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what the hell honey brown is, but uh, I remember I remember my, my uncle having one of those, and I think my dad did at one point, but dad never kept beer in the house. Um, rarely seen my dad drink any beer that I've seen him drink now is usually cause I've given him one like, Hey, try this, you know, and he'll drink it. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't drink whiskey or anything like that. My grandfather either, you know, uh, you know, never really kept, kept stuff in the house when I was growing up. Never, never got to see them drunk. So I, I, I missed that whole part of it. Right. I was never influenced negatively by that. Um, and then when I joined the military, I was I was too young, and, and I joined the National Guard, right? So I came back home, mm-hmm. and I was living with my family, and I was working, you know, at automotive, in the automotive industry and stuff like that, either parts sales or, or whatever. 
So I wasn't living in the barracks like most dudes in the military are, you know what I mean? Just getting fucking hammered drunk all the time. <laughs> so I, I skipped that whole get drunk thing. And then I turned 21 mm-hmm. in the air on my way to Afghanistan, went to Afghanistan. Even when I came back, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get drunk, man. Um, I had one time at a, at a, at a party, a Christmas party where I drank a, a combination of like a really heavy beer. Mm-hmm. Um, like it was this, uh, God, it, was, it was a clown shoes beer and it was like a Imperial stout or something like that. Really heavy, really dark beer, high, high alcohol content for beers, like 10%, 9-10%. And then somebody wanted to do like a, some shots of like a shots of tequila, but they they wanted to do like this uh, some kind of tequila drink, like as a, and, and I don't I don't really do liquor like that for that for that reason. I don't like being drunk. But mm-hmm. I did it, and it just didn't sit in my stomach, and I ended up I ended up getting sick and throwing up later. Oh. Not not that I was drunk, but like it just I did not it did not sit the mix. Yeah, it did not sit with me good, man. Um, yeah, that's, those are some of the only times, dude. Like I, I don't. I'll do the alcohol thing. I'm kind of glad I missed that. That whole bar scene, like going out and getting tore up, man. It just doesn't. I mean, I had. No, coming from the opposite side from you, because I did the house in fraternity. And uh, my 21st birthday, I got blackout drunk at a strip club. And I ended up, <laughs> ended up backstage. I, I don't remember exactly what happened backstage. But all my friends told me, like, I was back there for 10 minutes. And I walked out there, walked back out with a smile on my face. Oh, man. And I have no idea what happened. <laughs> I still to this day do not remember what happened. See, you don't remember, man. That sucks. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. Like, well, like I, the thing is, like, it's to me, it's all about the the person, what their preference is. You can't if you don't join a game drunk, then I can't force it on you. But also, too, on the other side of it, like if you enjoy getting drunk too much, you have a problem. Well, so yeah, for sure. And I like social interaction. I like talking to people. Mm-hmm. And I don't mind a little bit of alcohol because it does lower inhibitions, even yeah, in small, makes it more sociable. even in small amounts. You know, it, it helps people be sociable. Mm-hmm. And I like talking to people and getting to know people and having conversations. But I like having genuine conversations. And there's a point of diminishing returns. That's true. Yeah. And when people start getting drunk, like like I hate it, man. It's, it's going to make me sound sexist or whatever. But like drunk females, man. No, nah, you not. I feel the same way. Like, like drunk, drunk bitches, dude. Like, I, I, I cannot stand being around <laughs> drunk females, man. Because it, it, one, I feel bad for them. Yeah, then you get protective too. I find myself getting yeah, more protective. Yeah, I, I feel number one emotion is I feel bad for them because they're they're drunk, and a lot of times they're saying stuff that they don't really mean or stuff that they otherwise wouldn't say, and they're they're acting kind of lewd or they're being kind of loose with stuff, you know. And it. I'm not attracted to that. In fact, the opposite. You know, I'm like, man, I'm definitely not attracted to this. But then I want to protect them because other dudes will step in and take advantage of it, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. drunk. Well, it's like drunk it's not for me. It's weird. It's a, like what you said. It's like it's kind of weird watching. Well, there's some females like can handle it well. They're like, no, they get drunk. Yeah, they, they get a little obnoxious, but they're they're still holding themselves together. But then you get the really drunk females, and they get um, just out of control. Then you yeah. start seeing them in a different light. It's like, especially, especially if you're kind of attractive to them, like, ooh, that's pretty they're bad. Their, they're taking their fucking clothes off or whatever. They're hanging all over. They're trying to, like, grab your, your crotch or whatever. I mean, just crazy shit, man. You know <laughs> no, I, mean? I, like, I like that part, but, like, the part where they start crying or they start yelling at you or saying some bad stuff. It's yeah, like, it's these big swings, man. It's, it's, just, it's just bad, man. I, I like to stay away from that scene, and so... I feel I feel lucky that I I dodged I dodged that bullet. So well, also too, like I I just believe like it's all about the the person um, as an individual. Like some mm-hmm. people, you know, some people like to drink, but they could control it fine. If some people don't like to drink, yeah, that's fine too. Like the, yeah, more power. Big, big thing too. This this is the, this is the cop coming out of me, I guess, man. <laughs> Is I get I get to see what happens when people you know go drink and Over have a drink. good time and then they and then they get in their fucking car and, yeah. they, and they drive somewhere and then they then they kill people or they hurt people or they cause serious property damage. Uh, yeah, man, drinking and driving is bad. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's the one thing. Um, yeah, that's one of the worst uh, things about alcohol. It's like the difference between weed and alcohol. And one thing I could say is like. If I was ever mad, high, I actually think about why I was mad. Okay, so why am I mad at this person? Why, why is my ego hurt? 
now I actually start thinking about it. I'm like, okay, am I right about what I said? Or am I right? Am I right for being angry? But the thing about alcohol, let's say if I was mad at the same person, I might not even think about that stuff. I'll just think about like, oh, I need to protect my ego. Yeah, you're just like, I'm mad. Yeah, I'm, I'm just mad. Oh, I need to do something about yeah. or say something or... But like, uh, yeah, so going back to what you said, I'd, I'd just rather deal with a freaking someone high. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, beer's got a lot of calories, man. So, like, I got to go run tomorrow. <laughs> Drink some beer tonight. So. Drink some beer. Also, go back. I have some notes about you, too. Um, you do the gun gun competitions, right? Yeah, man. I shoot that's a little pretty, bit. Yeah, I see the pictures, man. Like, that's pretty cool. So I'm not, <laughs> some of the not, videos. I'm not necessarily competitive. Maybe on the local, you know, little club, having fun match, I'm competitive. But I just do that as a way to, uh, to, to help me... I guess become kind of inoculated to the to the stress. So it's it's not the same kind of stress you would feel in a gunfight. Excuse me. No, I say that with you know, like I haven't been in a gunfight in the police department. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been on scenes where shots have been fired and stuff like that, but I've been I've been shot at and I've shot back the- uh, in 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 Afghanistan okay, in, in the military. Right. Okay. So I've been in some some hairy some hairy situations before. But shooting competition is kind of weird, man, because you got like dudes watching dudes, which gives you enough stress as it is. And then you got that timer going off, man. And mm-hmm. you got this time constraint put on you. And then you got performance anxiety and all this other stuff. So it adds some stress to it. And it's good to, to shoot those things and, uh, and deal with that little bit of stress. And then I also run usually my, my duty gear, the same stuff I'm wearing on the street is mm-hmm. what I'm shooting in these competitions. Oh, I, wow. I just use it to give me – a little bit of practice, some extra reps. And it's not the same. It's not realistic. It, it's not training, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But it's just more repetitions with my... I mean, it helps out with aiming, too. Like it, it does. It does some of that. The cool thing about it is, and especially like like USPSA um, competitions that I shoot, uh, they're kind of ambiguous, these stages. It's like, here's the targets. Start here. The targets all got to be shot twice or whatever. Mm-hmm. And all steel has to fall down. And it's up to you to figure out how you're going to shoot all those targets within the set of rules that governs the, the sport you know that you're shooting, and um, so you're thinking. So your shooting, and your gun handling, has to be at a level of subconscious competence. It's got to be automatic. You can't be thinking about that, and be thinking about your stage plan or thinking about how you're going to move from target to target and how you're going to actually shoot this whole array of targets because they're set up in a way that's going to be, they're not linear. None of these things rarely are these matches linear where you start mm-hmm. here and you end over there and you shoot all these targets on the way. Yeah. There's targets all over the place. There's targets where your view is obstructed, where you've got to come from one side or the other. And you have to develop this plan of how you're going to move from the start point to wherever your end point is. And at the end of the, you know, the stage, you have shot all of the targets the required amount of times. And so you have to think about it. And so it divides your attention. And your shooting and your gun handling has to be kind of automatic. You can't be thinking about it. And, and on occasions where you have to think about your gun handling, or maybe like you're shooting and you're not shooting quite on par and you've got to really bear down and focus on your fundamentals and on your front side to hit whatever steel or whatever you're shooting at, a lot of times the rest of your stage will kind of go to shit, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's kind of like golf in that, there's nobody to be mad at but you. Mm. There's the stage, stage, right? Yeah. Or there's the fucking fourth hole, and there's you. And it's like, shoot it or play it in the golf analogy and see what the outcome is. Make the best of it. Um, and it's not forgiven. It's, it's not forgiving when you, when you fuck up, kind of like golf is. Mm-hmm. You know? That timer's still running. To your last shot. That's a sport. Goes down range. So it's it's cool, man. You're playing yourself. And mm-hmm. then you're playing your buddies too, because then you watch your buddies do the thing. <laughs> Just like off. You watch your buddies hit the same you know, play the play the same hole and you know you can kind of compare and figure yourself out, see where you're at, or it's pretty neat. Uh, if they put a time hack on golf, where from the time, you know, somebody hits a buzzer after you you're teed up, and then you're going golf with a with a time standard, and so you're comparing yourself not about what you shot. But about what you shot plus your total time. Mm-hmm. And whoever plays those 18 holes and comes in with the shortest amount of time and has the best score or come up with some kind of metric to kind of bounce all that out, then it'll be closer to, to shooting sports. But 
it's fun, man. It's 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 one of my one of my hobbies. Well, so that's one one of the things I want to actually get into in the future and get money for. Um, my thing is who, because that's why I, one of the reasons why I got them all in thirty thirty because the lever action. I kind of like the old fashioned, not the single. I like I would I would do competitions with a revolver, but not single action. Yeah, single action is a whole nother level, man. Those <laughs> cowboy shooters. I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. I've never shot one of those or seen one of those shot in person. Um, but it's cool, man. Shooting competition is pretty neat. And, and usually, in my experience, everybody's really nice. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, they're prepared to receive feedback. New and... shooters. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Or people new to the sport. And um, usually, you don't get cops going there. You don't get a lot of cops. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, you don't get a lot of cops. You don't get a lot of military dudes um, because they have this ego thing. You know, oh, I'm a cop, I'm a military. And they don't want to go there and be put under those pressures, those time constraints. Mm-hmm. That dude's watching dudes thing, you know, making them sweat. They don't want to have that performance anxiety where they got to throw down in front of people and then shit the bed in front of a bunch of, like, civilians that do computer programming or fucking live in their mom's house and play world of warcraft or whatever they don't want to they don't want to they don't want to suck in front of those guys or get beat by those guys but for the ones that can swallow their ego and go it's good man because there's some there's some fat guys that do computer programming Mm -hmm. they live in their mom's basement they play world of warcraft they will fucking burn you down in a gunfight these dudes are some shooting sons of bitches (laughs) you don't know like you could be shit hot at open range or a qualification in your police department or in your unit at the military. And you go to one of these shooting competitions and you will get fucking embarrassed by somebody who's never put on a uniform a day in their life. That's not to say that that person could go do your job. That's true. Right. But as far as it comes to just objectively like gun handling, moving through this stage, poking holes in paper with bullets, they'll make you look bad. They'll humble you real, real, real fast. It's almost, <laughs> it's not as bad as jujitsu, but it's almost like jujitsu. Mm. You're like, oh, I'm strong. I'm fit. I know how to fight. Yeah, go, go get on a fucking, go put on a gi and go to a jujitsu gym yeah. and get, get fucking stacked. Get rolled up and you'll be like, man, I don't know shit. <laughs> I just got crushed by some 130 pound chick. Just choked you, you me the fuck humbled. out. Yeah, you will eat some humble pie real fast. Yeah, Shooting think, competitions is no different. I did Brazilian jujitsu for the, Two years I had stopped for a while now, but um, yeah, it's totally true. You said like the skinny, lean guys. I would think I okay, no, I'm going out muscle them, and yeah, I would out muscle them for like, but they're smart minutes. Yeah, but they <laughs> they were smarter, and more trained than me, and they knew what to do. Yeah, they're taking like, oh, their time. Right. They're just chilling. You're all sweaty and stuff. It's and like oh, working fuck, hard. They go, they go, I get choked out. <laughs> yeah, man, you just feel humble, you dude. Shooting competitions the same way, man. People, people can't. Can't swallow their ego, man. But they need I'm, to. But the thing is, like, I feel like that's a fun sport. I, like, so, that's something I really want to get to in the future. Try, man. It'll. They will be anybody that's there. Any of those those computer programmers. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll they'll shoot. I'll shoot you real bad. <laughs> they'll they'll take your hand, man. They'll bring you to their wing. They'll guide you along. They'll explain the rules to you. They'll help you out. As long as your basic safety, gun safety, and gun handling is there, which yours will be from your experience yeah. as a police officer, but I know um, they'll uh, they'll help you out, man. And they'll be they'll be cool, and you'll get bit. It's not that expensive either, man. Usually, you only need like like typically your IDPA matches or whatever, which mm-hmm. is usually what I would steer somebody to try. Man, it's usually like a hundred rounds. Oh. It's usually like fifteen to twenty five dollars match fee. That's not bad. So you're looking at spending if you're shooting a nine millimeter, mm-hmm. you're looking at spending let's say fifty bucks. And I know you're down in uh, in Florida or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, know, you look over there's uh, there's yeah Brunswick does some, and I know uh, like Ancient City something somewhere near Saint Augustine. Uh, Saint Augustine, I think it's called Ancient City. Some some gun range down there they do IDPA USPSA stuff. So mm-hmm. gotta check it out, man. It's pretty cool. Yeah, my like I was trying to say while well, I was saying earlier, um, I don't know, I just gotta think about revolvers. Like I I, I love kind of like the old fashioned shit. So, yeah. Like I would do with a Magnum or a Anaconda. Oh, dude, fucking! Do you have an Anaconda? No, not yet. But like, I, cold. You know, those are like pretty rare, right? Like, <laughs> cold well, Anacondas are pretty special. Well, like, uh, my idea was like, <clears throat> well, like I wanted a um. Okay, I got the Marlin 33 because I love the lever action because that's 
I love the cowboy shit. Mm-hmm. For, so that's okay. It's the why I love and also you've been practical. watching. You've been watching too much Westworld, dude. That's your problem. Oh, I love Westworld, <laughs> and I love. There's a show on Netflix called. Uh, I think it's called Godless. It's like a Western. Oh God, dude! It's on my. It's on my it's list. Fucking you know, amazing! Fuck, <laughs> it's a fucking every, beautiful show. Everything else is on my list too, man. I got a. I got a huge list of shit that I don't have time to watch, but. But like, um, Godless is on there. My thing is like, uh, I would um, do a revolver, but with moon clips. Yeah, there's, that's, there's that's some easier reload. The thing is, uh, with with this, I mean, I'm not discouraging you in any way. Mm-hmm. Like, fucking try it, man. If that's what makes your dick hard, like, go oh out there, God, and, so- go out there and shoot guns, man, and, and you'll be better for it. Um, you know, but there's some dudes that do it. I've seen some dudes do it in, in USPSA and stuff, and it's a whole other level of challenge. Yeah. My thing is, man, I don't go out there with the goal of being competitive. Like, I don't go out there like I'm going to win this match, mm-hmm. like I'm going to win this sport or whatever. I go out there with like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get repetitions. On my on my my duty gear, I'm gonna have fun, and I'm gonna make incremental improvements based on my own shooting, and then watching other people shoot. Because you watch other people do shit, and you learn from them. You'll say like, "Man, I don't want to fucking do that," or you'll see somebody do something, and you're like, "Damn, that was really good. Like, I need to I need to try that out." So that's that's my goal. That's my goal every time I go to a match, and you know, it's been working for me pretty pretty good since. And, I just don't, I don't heap a bunch of like uh, anticipation or anything on it. I just go have fun. Yeah, it's a fun. The thing is, people who never saw a gun and they're all anti-gun. Um, for me, I'm kind of a little conflicted about the Second Amendment stuff. But the thing is, like seeing a gun, like going for sports, it's just a fun, it's a fun thing. Like I, um, I like going to the range. This is a fun little stress release. It's a I was comparing a little bit to video games where um, you're doing hand-eye coordination. You know, you you just try and hit a small target with a, with a tool. Yeah, that's what it is for me, man. It's a tool, and you know, I don't I don't want to jump into in the Second Amendment stuff. But, um, but the thing cause is, because it, it's it's pretty, it gets pretty deep pretty fast. But in, in the grand scheme of things, man, for me, the gun is a tool. It's a tool that I hope I never have to use. It's on my belt. And uh, the adage, racist or not, you know, the, it's the Indian, not the arrow kind of thing. You know? <laughs> it's the Indian, not the arrow. I can say that because I got some uh, shit. Dude, I'm from Northeast Georgia, man. I got Everybody's got Cherokee in them, man. I'm Cherokee. Sure. My wife's like a fucking quarter Cherokee. <laughs> um, yeah, man, it's the Indian, not the arrow. So it's not about the gun, man. It, it, it's not about the gun. No, it's not. It's, it's mindset doing a job all right we're going to the question part of the interview for you guys who are new or yeah for you guys who are new or just start listening to this which most of you are i should have prepared for this man i've no. listened i've listened to a couple of your podcasts i well, should have prepared one thing, one thing i'm afraid of i don't want people being prepared for these questions but the reason why i ask these questions to new listeners is that uh, these are interpersonal questions these were developed by dr sam goslin I got that right. Um, be, these questions are supposed to show like an interpersonal, your kind of like your inner self, the self that you don't really show people. You just you just met. You, this is a self that only people you love or you're intimate with will know. So like your wife, your husband, your mother, father, children, that kind of stuff. So these questions are supposed to show like a difference. The different side of you and the reason why i ask these questions because i have the whole goal for this podcast is i want to get the full spectrum of the human condition and with doing that you're going to have different viewpoints different opinions and you're not going to agree with a lot of things what people say for a good example you're not going to agree with uh you no know, police work or shooting guns but these questions are supposed to show that you know what you could disagree with the lifestyle or their choices, but you could agree with them as a person. You could share something with them as a person. So this is why I ask these questions, and this is why I ask these questions at the end of the interview, too. So let's get started. All right. I'm anxious. Given the choice of anyone in the world from any time period, who would you want as a dinner guest and why? Yeah. I don't know, dude. So, so, so two people jump out at me for, for, for two different reasons. Do. 
I use two. There's no wrong. There's no wrong answer to these questions yeah, yeah. unless you say Hitler. I'll do, yeah, that's, that's unless you unless you like you want to meet him and then kill him, right? Like, yeah. That's cool, right? Uh, no, dude. Uh, so I'll do the first one, man. The one that just jumps out immediately is uh, Valentino Rossi. Who's that? Valentino Rossi. He's a uh, he's a motorcycle rider. He's one of the most famous. Definitely the most famous. Right now on the world level, he's an Italian guy, man. I love motorcycles. I love riding motorcycles. I love watching motorcycle racing. It enriches my life. Mm-hmm. Um, I smile because of motorcycles. <laughs> it's fun. I, I still have my Honda. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I, got it. I, have a, uh, I have a TL1000R. Uh, a Suzuki. Ooh. A 1999 uh, TL1000R in the garage. It's in a couple pieces right now that I'm working on. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, man, I love motorcycles, dude. Sport bikes, Harleys, whatever. But no, he's uh, he's a great motorcycle racer, man. It makes me smile. I love watching him on TV, man. It, it just I've been to see him live at Indianapolis, the last uh, GP that they ran there. So Valentino Rossi, that's my just like a uh, fanboy guy that I would want. Why? Um, just because of uh, he's only if you you really understand like the motorcycle racing, the significance. But he is. God, I can't think of another person to compare him to. He is the pinnacle. He is the top of his sport mm-hmm. as far as you know, like popularity or fandom or whatever, money, all this stuff. Um, he's one of the greats. Uh, he's the great. He's he's the best that's ever lived, in, in in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinions. And if you look at statistics and how many world championships this guy's won, and he lives in my time, you know. It's not like I'm looking back in the past at like this guy, like, oh, this guy was great. Like, no, I'm watching him actively do this he, stuff. As he's I'm, here. <laughs> as I'm coming along. He's here in the now and the present. He's amazing. And he's going to go down in history. And to be able to uh, to be able to have a beer with that dude, that'd be pretty cool. So that's my, that's my, that's my, my, my shallow, that's my shallow <laughs> one. What's the second one? For a second one, I'll do one because uh, we watched a video on this dude today and it was pretty cool. There's a guy named Roy Benavidez. Now, he's dead. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, uh, Master Sergeant uh, Roy Benavidez uh, re- retired. Roy Benavidez was a uh, he was born in Texas, joined the Texas National Guard, went to the 82nd Airborne, went to the Special Forces, deployed to Vietnam a couple of times. And uh, long story short, he, uh, as a Special Forces guy, he volunteered or jumped on a fourth and final rescue attempt helicopter for this special forces a team that was pinned down and everybody in this in this team all 12 of these dudes had either been killed or or seriously wounded and he went on the suicide mission he jumped out of this freaking helicopter like a knife and an aid bag and ran to go try to rescue these guys and it ended up being like the six or eight hour ordeal he was shot multiple times as soon as he got off the helicopter he ended up being shot like five or eight times or something he was bayoneted a couple of times all this stuff, man. He was he was he was jacked up. Loaded these dudes on this helicopter. Then the helicopter got shot down. Helicopter Fuck. crashed. Holy he rescued shit. everybody out of the helicopter. He didn't put them on another helicopter. This dude was running back and forth like in the fray through enemy fire, like loading up bodies um, of dead uh, you know Americans. Mm-hmm. He ended up loading up some enemy soldiers just because he was so preoccupied with loading people up. Finally got on the helicopter. Um, they took him back and they thought he was dead, man. He stacked him next to a bunch of NVA. They were dead. They thought he was dead. They're coming around. <clears throat> They're checking him out. The doctor's touching his chest or his neck to check his pulse. He can't move. He can't talk, man, because his jaw's swollen shut. His jaw's broken. He's been shot through the face. Mm-hmm. And he spits in the doctor's face. That's the only thing he can do to communicate to this doctor, like, yo, I'm alive. Like, yeah. don't kill me. So they went and they saved him, man. They thought this dude was dead. He should be dead for... Looking at all the injuries that he sustained, but uh, he ended up winning the uh, the Medal of Honor and uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. And he um, he's a Hispanic dude, and uh, he always spoke uh, about like it doesn't matter what what race somebody is if they're black, white, Mexican, whatever. Mm-hmm. He never paid attention to any of that. You know, he was just there wearing green, <laughs> bleeding red, white, and blue. <laughs> you know, doing doing real shit for his country, man. And it was cool. And uh, I, in training today, we we watched a little video about him, and I've known about him for since I was a, you know a real young guy in my shit man preteens, and he's always been a pretty amazing dude. So I'd say, yeah, man, if I could if I could buy Roy Benavidez a beer, <laughs> you know, s- salute his Medal of Honor, 
Like that'd be that'd be pretty. I awesome. just sit down and talk to him and pick his brain. Like, man, who the hell are you? Dude, so humble, man. <laughs> Incredibly humble. Cool guy. Okay. What would constitute a perfect day for you? A perfect day, man. So, what's cool for me is uh, like if if I'm working midnights and my girls are already up, mm-hmm. and I wake up in the afternoon and I come downstairs. My daughters, uh, Selah and Sabine, they uh, they start doing like the daddy dance. You know, they're like, Daddy, Daddy's home. You know, they, <laughs> yeah. they want to give me hugs and kisses and stuff like that. So, And then morning time, um, you know, if, I, if I'm working nights and I come home in the morning and they're up, you know, they hear the key in the door and they're doing the daddy dance at the top of the stairs when I come in. Um, or... Uh, or if I'm already awake and they happen to wake up before I leave for work, you know, it's like, oh, daddy's home. And so any, any day that I can start with that is, is automatically good. Uh, and then I'm going to say, I want to say going to work, man. People, people live for the weekend, dude. I, I live for going to work, man. <laughs> Middle of my weekend, I'm like, fuck, dude, I want to go back to work. <laughs> I like it, man. I like, I like my crew. I like my watch, that tribe you're talking about, mm-hmm. man. I, I like getting with those dudes. I like putting on the uniform. I like going out and doing... Doing good, man. Serving, serving people, and trying to trying to help you know, take take real bad dudes off the street and make shit better for my community. I know that sounds like altruistic and, and bogus, man, but that's for real. I love going to work. And then there's that that selfish side too. <laughs> the when you, selfish side. When you, when you get to chase people. Yeah, that's yeah. People forget, or people don't really know. Like there are cops who actually do it for. In it because they actually believe in the job itself. Yeah, man, it's a comedy. I believe in the job, and then the, the shit is fun, man. It's a, it's a, it's a good job, man. It's a rewarding it's a rewarding career. I can't imagine doing anything else. Uh, unlike the military, um, I apart from some small time conflict with some supervisors in the past, I can't immediately recollect a day where like I didn't want to wake up and go to work. Where I woke up and I was like, fuck, I don't want to go to work. I want to check off or whatever. Um, and I, w- I want to go to work. On my weekend, I'm thinking about when my weekend's over, going back to work. So <laughs> I like it. Um, and then coming home, you know, having a good day at work, maybe chasing somebody, <laughs> uh, ca- catching a bad dude. Um, coming home, seeing my girls again, daddy dance when I come home, eating some good food, going running. Some venison. Yeah, man. Go run, go run, you know, five, eight, ten miles. And well, that's a lot. Come back and drink some beer and go to bed at like 8.30 like an old man, dude. Because I, I go to bed, I go to bed super, I go to bed super early, man. Yeah, well, it's also the schedule, too. It's like, yeah, yeah. you're switching I, from midnight to free. I like, I like sleep, dude. I take, I take, I take a little magnesium supplement, which for your audience, if you're not taking magnesium, you're wrong. That shit is the best. Look it up. It's good. I take a little magnesium. Go to sleep at like eight thirty, man. Sleep like a baby. Ooh, that's that's my that's my ideal day. <laughs> All right, this is a little. Oh, this is kind of uh, what's the word? A uh, little deep right here, but also this is also Halloween. Not Halloween, but we're in the October month. Of yeah, there's for for the audience. There's uh, we're in my house and my wife and kids decorated for Halloween. There's Halloween shit everywhere. Yeah. Now, this is my favorite time of year, and uh, on the way up here, I have a playlist of Halloween music. I was listening to it on the way here. Oh, nice. But um, do you have a secret hunch on the way you will die? A secret hunch on the way I will die? Yeah. Oh, fuck, dude. Um, <laughs> let me tell you first how I don't want to die. I don't want to die drowning. Oh, yeah, that uh, I don't suck. like water, man. I don't like swimming. I can swim. Excuse me. I can swim. I do, I do not like swimming. I don't like being in the water. I don't go to the... I, I live in coastal Georgia. I don't go to the fucking beach, dude. Fuck a beach. I'd rather go to the mountains or the desert. Uh, can't stand the beach. Uh, so I don't want to drown. And I don't want to burn to death. Mm-hmm. Burning to death seems pretty fucking terrible, right? Um, so I, one thing we, we, we didn't talk about, like, I'm a bomb tech. Oh, yeah. I forgot to uh, touch on that. Yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a public safety bomb tech. So I'm a... I'm a Bob guy. Um, I don't want to. I'm not saying I want to die getting killed by a bomb. Mm-hmm. If I got killed by a bomb, chances are I wouldn't really have a whole lot of time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that'd be pretty good. No, nah, man. Uh, man, I don't know, dude. 
I mean, like, a, this is a really tough question. It a is. A lot of people it, get stuck. A lot of people don't think about their mortality. So, and like, like I, I think about I think about my mortality all the time. So between Afghanistan and between what I do for a living, like, it's a reality for me. Mm-hmm. So accepting my own mortality is like a no shit every day. You know, I, it's in my mind, and I'm like, okay, no, this is real. This is we're playing for all the marbles here. Let's, let's go do work. Um, I wouldn't mind dying. I wouldn't mind dying at work, um, in the military or on the law enforcement side. Mm-hmm. But I want to. You hear about these these poor cops, man. And I hate it for them, dude. They're they're fucking ambushed or whatever. They don't get a chance to fight back. Let me fight back, dude. Let me at least get my gun out of my holster. Let me have some spent brass, you know, laying around me. Die. Let me, let me kill that fucking douchebag too, you know. <laughs> like let me let me kill that son of a bitch. And then when they look at him, they're like they look at our both our bodies, you know. They're like, oh man, you got a lucky shot on on Drew, but man, Drew shot like a fucking nice ass, you know, bill drill in this dude's chest or or uh, or failure drill. You well, know? I remember this comedian on like a uh, Patton Oswalt. He made a joke about it, but I always thought how s- serious the joke was. It's like that's only part of it, but he said like you know, his dog is a little pug, and he was trying to protect protect him from another dog. Mm-hmm. He, the dog was going to die anyway, but he said like he's he is a descendant of a wolf, and he wanted to die with his teeth out. Yeah, die with your teeth <laughs> he, out, dude. He Fuck wanted to yeah, die man. with his teeth out. <laughs> it's kind of cliche that whole you know uh, you know till Valhalla, you know die in battle Viking shit. You know, oh, I love like, that. You know, I love that mythology. You know, come back with your shield around it, kind of kind of stuff, right? It, it, it's kind of played out a little bit now, but yeah, fuck yeah, man. Like, I want to I want to die fighting though. I want I want to be given a fair chance, and and I want to I want to go out. On a blaze of glory. That'd be a pretty, that'd be a, that'd be a good death. Yeah, my, I thought about the other day when I got a little stoned. I rather, I don't want to die as a lonely old man. I'd rather die young and with my friends, uh, with the people I love. Yeah, man. But okay, next question. How's it going? How's it going? If you could change anything about the way you were raised, what would it be? Oh shit, dude! I don't know, man. So we didn't we didn't dig into in the depth about it, but I talked about being homeschooled. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was homeschooled most of my life. Um, I went to elementary school, or, excuse me, yeah, elementary school for a short period of time. Went back to being homeschooled, and then when I was sixteen, before going to that tech school we talked about in the beginning, mm-hmm. um, I went to high school for a little bit of time. So a lot of it would be, I don't know, I don't know. I've always thought about that. Like, like, what if I went to school instead of being homeschooled? Mm-hmm. Um, what if, like, shit? I'll tell you. This is if I could change one thing about being raised, um, I would have got way more fucking spankings than I got. <laughs> put it that Why? Way. Let's do that. Let's do what? that. I'll go. I'll go this route with it, man. Because my dad beat my ass. <laughs> uh, like, not, not child abuse. Um, every every weapon I ever got, I, I needed, and and then some, man. Um, firm believer in, in that type of that type of punishment. Mm-hmm. Um, I spanked my girls nowhere near with the, the, the fervor that my dad spanked me. <laughs> but um, yeah, man, I would have got, got spanked more because I've seen my brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. So I've got three brothers and four sisters, and they're all younger than me. I'm the oldest of eight, and uh, they were all spanked much less than I was, and I think they're worse for it. Uh, and and I. I I look back and I got away with some shit that I shouldn't have. So I think if my dad would have been even a little bit harder on me, I would have been I would have been better for it. But I, I don't like I don't really like taking that stance though. Generally, on like what would I change kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, maybe acknowledging what I did or didn't do, but not not what would I change because who knows what implications changing something would be, or maybe that implies a little bit of displeasure or discontentment with where you're at in the present. Hmm. And um, and the, the the shit that's happened to me growing up and and through my life and through my career, it's made me who I am, and it's it's made me have the opinions that I have and the feelings that I have now. And I don't know if I'd want to change any of it, man, because I kind of I kind of like where I'm at. And I mean, I got some shit going on. Uh, we all do. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got some. I got some. I got. Yeah, I got. I got marital issues to spare. If anybody wants to call me, I'll, I'll share them with you. <laughs> uh, my fault, uh, not not hers. But 
Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I want to change, man. Because it's all it's all led me to here. It's been a it's been a wild ride. It's been pretty fun. But being spanked more helps anybody. <laughs> That's my opinion. Yeah, should have been spanked more. Well, the thing is, um, you gotta accept. You can't change the past. All you need to do is just accept it. What happened and learn from it. Yeah, yeah. And make better decisions from it. Well, I mean, I will say, like, like I was raised. I was raised. Uh, my parents are are, are uh, Baptist or Southern Southern Baptist. So I was raised, you know, with uh, Judeo Christian values and stuff like that. Um, I'm not. I'm kind of atheist mm-hmm. um, now, later in life. But I appreciate. I I appreciate the lessons that I learned going to church and, and being brought up that way. Yeah, that's some, some of the morals that that instilled in me, man, because I, I think that the, when you boil it down, I think religion existed as the, the earliest form of government. Mm. You know, I think you had people that were, that were leaders, uh, strong leaders, and they needed to lead and govern a group of people. What better way to do that than to say that, you know, you have some connection to this divine being, whatever his name is. Mm. We'll call him or, Bob. Or her name is, right? You have this connection to this divine being, and this divine being says this shit is wrong. You know what I mean? I think it's like the applied science of government is religion, you know, and back then religion was government. And uh, that's how they that's how they govern people. Well well, why don't we why don't we do this? Well, because God says don't do that shit, you know? Like so I think that's where it came from. Um But because of that, you know, there's there's some there's some legit morals to be taken away from from New Testament Christianity, you know, turning the other cheek and humility and all this other stuff. There's some other shit I don't really like, though. Yeah, of course. Because uh, Christianity is pretty uh, socialist and communist in some ways. Communist. With the way they look at stuff, yeah, with, with you know, selling everything you have, giving it to the poor. And yeah. everybody, everybody's the same. And do all- well, at the same time, the pastor is like a billion-dollar church. Well, so, uh- <laughs> yeah, without, 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 without touching that stuff, that shit offends me pretty bad, but... Uh, I mean, if you, I'm, I'm a, I'm a pretty strong cap, capitalist. I'm mm-hmm. pretty conservative, not libertarian because uh, they align themselves too much with like an anti-cop sentiment, an anti-government, mm-hmm. and having lived on both sides and, and seen some some different views of that, like the police and laws and rule of laws is necessary. In this fantasy of like do whatever you want shit that you know some of this libertarian stance takes is it's, 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 it's kind of ridiculous like it's impossible it's, yeah it kind of like anarchy to a certain yeah point. It, it ain't gonna fucking happen like real world so uh you know and i wouldn't say i'm a republican because republicans need to let go of a lot of the the social you know christian shit that they hold on to like hating on homosexuality or other oh, stuff like that. Like they need to get off of that stuff, man. That's that's jamming them up. So, yeah, I'm, I'm conservative. I'm, I'm a capitalist, and those being conservative in government or in political view, and being capitalist in economical views, uh, those those stand uh, apart from traditional Christian or Judeo Christian teachings and values. So, if you look at Jesus and what Jesus did and what Jesus mm-hmm. taught. It wasn't capitalism, you know what I mean? Because capitalism is is selfishness it's, in business. It's competition. <laughs> yeah. It's it's, a, well, capitalism is supposed to be just competition. Yeah, I man. You try to get you try to get rich. Like, yeah. who the fuck's not right? So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's weird, but I, I appreciate I appreciate coming up in the in the in the church and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And my parents, man, my parents, my brothers, my sisters, you know, they they wholeheartedly believe this stuff. I look at it now, and I'm like, man, this this shit is. Shit is a joke, but uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that I was raised in the in the church because it's it's made me it's made me who I am. It's gave me a different a different worldview. And then I get to go to Afghanistan. And I get to see what the extreme, Oof, man. what the extreme side of Islam looks like, and that's pretty fucking scary too. So I can't man. People need to stop reading old books and killing each other about it, dude. It's like just the honor killing and yeah, shit. yeah, man. They they need to stop like. Who cares? Who cares what your old book says? Yeah, no. Drink, drink, drink craft beer. Drink it. Oh, be this tastes fucking, good. <laughs> be, be fucking happy. Shoot competitions. Have a good time. It's like, hey, 
you can have sex with a woman and not be married. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's like if you, if you, man, I don't know. I can understand that, right? Like if if one dude's wife has sex with another dude and that dude's mad and he wants to like fight or kill that guy, like mm-hmm. I can understand that. It's wrong. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do what I can to prevent that that crime yeah. or whatever and arrest that dude. But I can understand it. But if if one dude's book says the other dude's book is wrong, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? This really old book. And they're and they're gonna kill each other over it, or or make fucking car bombs, or or have crusades. Like the fuck he out job, of here, man. Like he jobs with. Um, yeah. what, do you, what do you call it when the jihad, man. jihad, they're there jihad, they're they're holy war, right? Like, yeah, we get we gotta stop fucking killing each other because our books. My my say th- different shit. My thing is like a couple of years because I got a little atheist for a while, and I started reading some books about the, a different perspective on religion. Mm. And how these, like a lot of these stories from different cultures that I never had communication with each other are telling similar, if not the same stories. And my thing is, I started believing, like, I think, yeah, also what you said too about the religion part, that it was the first form of government, but also that I think there's the other side to it that's got lost and we need to start learning about it. Like, this is also communicating one lost history that I think. I believe like there's parts of history that was lost and a religion. No, certainly. Like, religion or myth has been able to keep that part alive until we find evidence of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I guess that's kind of like agnosticism, like mm-hmm. kind of boiled down, you know, like I don't know. Like, mm-hmm. Nobody wants to have that answer of I don't know. Right. It's but like, it, what about this? You know, well, it's like, I don't know. What about well, God? You know, why are we here? Like, I don't know. Um, well, that's the best answer. Trying right? to figure that out. You know? It's better than to say like, oh, yeah, I know for sure. So, let's say I don't know. Let's go find out. Yeah, I don't want to say – I hate to say atheist, man, because atheist – Excuse me, atheist. Um, the word atheist and atheism brings a lot of connotation. It's not the word; it's just the people behind it too. Yeah, so you, you get this, you get stereotyped as having this like I hate or I'm against or I'm mm-hmm. anti, um, and then you have like agnosticism, and that's you know like this whole other kind of weird thing. I just, I don't know. So I'll say that I don't know. What? I don't know what to believe. I'm not really influenced by some higher power. Mm-hmm. Just do my job, man. My my Enjoy thing. Life. My thing is, I uh, if I'm wrong when I die, like shit, you know. Well, God can't blame. He's like, yeah. hey, you know, at least you were trying to figure it out. Mom, <laughs> at least you were not blinded to mom, it. Mom was right. <laughs> Sorry, mom. If you listen to this podcast, we have these arguments all the time, and we usually agree to just not talk about not talk about religion. My, my family and I. One thing that actually saw made me do. I do believe in there's something out there, and believe it or not. It's going to sound awful, but it came when I smoked DMT. The oh, DMT, man. So, like, I had a DMT lab once. Really? Yeah. Like, we had a, we had, we was had, that for the, for the unit? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was on uh, when I was working in our college. We had a, we had a DMT lab. <laughs> Why? Yeah, dude. I was, uh, was it just for an undercover operation? We had a or? lot of guns, too. No, I mean, we had, you know, been, people had been... Uh, Buying, uh, I guess, buying buying stuff from or whatever. Like, probable cause was obtained to have mm-hmm. a search warrant in this house where they were taking DMT. And, oh, okay. And extracting the oils from the root and then making DMT to then sell it to people to okay. use or abuse or whatever. It's a controlled substance. So Yeah, it's a... Yeah, hit a DMT lab one time. I watched uh, Joe Rogan's little weird documentary about DMT. Well, like... It's about, I, that's about the extent of my knowledge. I, I can't even pronounce the word the DMT. Did my... I, 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 well, I don't know. I smoked it because I... You know, Joe Rogan and shit. I'm like, no, I, I want to see what's going on. And the thing is, I did mushrooms before that. I tried the LSD before that. And I knew walking away from that, okay, this was a hallucination. I know afterwards, like, okay, I believe for a fact this was all in my mind. It was just from a drug. Or with DMT, I only last five minutes, but it feels like you were it away. It only lasts five minutes? Yeah. It's not. Fuck. It's not. You're not hot. And when you're done, when you come down of it, it's not like you're uh, hungover or anything. You just. You walk away with wonder. Really, just a, a sense of wonder. And just... Like, there's something else behind the curtain. Like, you, you can't say for sure. You all know for sure. But like, you feel like there's something else behind the curtain. Like. Oh, yeah. See that? Yeah. See that? And and it's hard to say, too, because you took a drug and do it. But it's also, at the same time, it's like... You can't discredit the experience. So... Again, the, the extent of my knowledge of DMT is uh, 
just from the legal aspect. A, a code book in Georgia, <laughs> you know, the official code of Georgia annotated. Uh, and then that lab that I hit, Wikipedia. Wikipedia. <laughs> And, uh, oh, wait. In the documentary, the that Netflix. Joe, in, Netflix. In the documentary that Joe Rogan had on Netflix about uh, you know tripping balls on DMT and getting in like a hyperbaric chamber or whatever. So I, didn't, I haven't done that, but like a uh, quick story before we move on to a question. I did it with one of my friends, and I I was watching him make sure he was all right, but then he turned his he turned his seat because like he didn't feel comfortable with me watching him make sure he was all right because he didn't want to freak out. So we were both looking at the the, the tree line and when we came down he I was telling him like yeah I saw some figure it, lo- it looked like a monster but like a friendly monster that's the only way I could describe it I know this sounds crazy that my friend described something else but then he pulled up a picture and the outline of the picture of the figure that he saw was the same thing I saw I'm like what the fuck Damn. <laughs> I, I'm like and the thing is like I, I don't want to say I don't know what to say about that. I know, like, rash- logically and rationally and si- scientifically, there's going to be hallucination, but it's weird that we both saw the same thing. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's weird shit that goes on with that, man. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not yeah, you're, you're educated not in that kind of stuff, dude, but no, there's, a, it's weird. there's weird stuff that happens without explanation. Yeah. And maybe that's why people point to religion. Because they can't explain shit, so they just put it in religion. You know, like, there's a... Uh, Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine, you know, it's, it's basically saying like, it's the do all, the cover all stuff, even though it's an Old Testament verse, and it's it's like, uh, you know, like the shit's supposed to be secret is essentially what it's saying. Like, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Religion, yeah, don't yeah. worry about this. It's, it's pretty much that's pretty much what it <laughs> says. I'm, I'm not going to quote it. I'm going to quote scripture on your on your podcast. Right, go, go ahead, I'm gonna for you for your audience. Go look at Deut- no, Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine. Actually, I'm going to look it up right now because I want to know what. It says. I hope I'm fucking remembering it right. Because that'd be interesting. Let's see, give me one second. Do don't ask me. Deuteronomy. What you said, twenty nine, twenty nine. Yeah. Ooh, that popped up pretty fast. It's twenty nine, twenty nine. Hope so. The, okay, well, let me pull this up. Yeah, Google finished it for me. That's usually a pretty good idea. Let me get yeah. the King James version of okay. the sixteen eleven right. authorized you version here. All right, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us. And our children forever that me wait that we may do all the words of this law. So the secret things belong mm-hmm. unto the Lord our God. So I heard a preacher cite this one time, man. It was after. Now it wasn't some stupid question like you know can God create a mountain and he can't move oh. or something like that. But it was Beautiful basically, verse. yeah, it was a question that you know there wasn't a good answer for. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like uh, kind of like well, like why didn't Jesus say anything about slavery is bad, right? Like yeah. some shit like that. <laughs> yeah. Yo, guys, you should be using other people. Yeah, as like cattle. like well, why didn't they say that? You know, in fact, you know, there's verses that say kind of the contrary. It's like hey, if you're a slave, like do good work. You know, like. <laughs> Like, or you go to hell. It's kind, of, <laughs> kind of fucked up, you know. So you ask questions like that, you know, and the, the preacher's like, "I do it around twenty nine, you twenty nine, you know, the secret things like it's not those are for the Lord, they're not for us." Yeah, but also, or like what my mom used to tell me, you know, when I would ask questions like mm-hmm. that, because you know you get questions as you start growing up. And you're like, well, "Mom, what about this?" You know, she's like, "I don't know. Ask God when you get to heaven." <laughs> you know, like <laughs> oh. look at a, what a cheap ass answer is. Ask God when you get to heaven. Yeah. Well, also, there's like a little part at the end of it that actually equals, equal, it's a, equal, it's a, equalizes it. There we go. That was says, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. I, I think it, to me, I took that as, it's also a matter of perspective too, because when I read that end of it, it's like, okay, that means it's okay to explore, like actually go find the answers. Mm-hmm. And then those answers will be not only mine, but everyone else's. But then when you, when you have answers and questions, or at least my experience in, in you know dealing with organized religion anyway, is you have answers, correction, you have questions that mm-hmm. don't maybe have answers. And they either give you some verse like that, or they say, you should have childlike faith. You should just believe. That's why it's faith. Mm-hmm. Because you believe. And it's like, no, oh, dog, like this is a pretty legit question. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, I, I don't know, man. It, it, it's been neat. Like, I'm glad... I'm glad that I came that I came up that way and that I had those those lessons in life and 
don't know where I'm at right now. I don't know. That's my answer. It's agnostic it's, as fuck. It's I don't not, know. Well, it's never... I don't think it's wrong to say, I don't know. I really... I think people should say it more often. Like, if they really don't know, they say, I don't know. I think it's wrong to be... Uh, I think certainty could be wrong in a lot of ways. For sure. Let's say, answer like, yes, I know for sure. I'm like, are... It's okay to say I don't know, but it's hey, dangerous but it, to say I for sure. It'd be better to say, like, hey, for me, based on what I've yeah. done and, like, my worldview, this is where I'm at. You know, this is maybe where you're at. And unless it's objectively wrong, you know, like, you know, causing harm to somebody else. Like, yeah, don't know, hurt maybe, maybe it's open for discussion. Right. We'll move on to the next question. This will be a little more fun. And this is a question I highlight because of you. If you were arrested and your family and friends were not aware of what you were charged with, what would they assume you were arrested for? Oh, <laughs> shit, dude. I don't know, man. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know what they would think, dude. Like uh, some type of firearms violation <laughs> or, uh, or like, uh, like a disorderly conduct or like, like a like battery. Like I got in a fight or something like that like with somebody. That's probably what they would think. I got in a fight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty funny. Okay. If you could wake up tomorrow and gain any power or ability, what would it be and why? Oh, shit, dude. If I could gain, like, a power ability. This one's tough, man. Like, we're talking about, like, like, like superheroes? Yeah. <laughs> that kind of shit. What, what were your, your desire was to, to have as a kid or even now? What would it be? I'm going to say... Let's see, flying. Flying. Yeah, flying. <laughs> flying would be pretty cool. The go-to like that. Yeah, flying, flying's pretty cool. But with wings, like Archangel, not like Superman, like you just fucking punch, you know, you just start, like, no. Nah. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll be cool Archangel for that. Archangel from, from X-Men, dude. Yeah. Like, Marvel's better. DC, Marvel's better. DC sucks. <laughs> well, somebody explain, explain, it was an actual famous co- comic book writer explaining why Marvel was better than DC. And it was actually pretty logical. He said, DC... It's the powers. The story is about the powers itself, except for Batman. Batman's just the one that. Okay, no, Batman's a, legit. Yeah, that's like, a, that's a different wore, that's a different wore category. A Batman shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Batman. Yeah. If you're if you're a cop and you don't like somehow kind of like like Batman, you're you're fucking wrong. Well, he, Batman's cool. But he he also said what makes Marvel more likable to the masses is that it's about the person with the powers. So the greatest example would be Spider Man. Like this is a this is a kid who ha- who's given powers great great responsibility, great power comes with great responsibility, and he um you see him struggle with it, you see him like as like growing up with the powers like hey, okay I gotta still go to school still go make money but also too I gotta go stop Doc Ock. <laughs> yeah, Sp- Spider Man was a cool. It, it's it's funny too listening to like Stan Lee. Mm-hmm. And some of these some of these guys talk about like Spider Man and shit like that. I'm not a big comic book guy, like like nerd and stuff like that. But I just watched these cartoons growing up, you know, mm-hmm. in the in the '90s. Um, Spider Man was Spider Man was one of them. X Men. All oh, those cartoons were amazing. Yeah, shit like that, man. It, uh, about it, the whole it, it D- who I am. About the whole DVD set of the the anime the Batman of anime adventures because mm-hmm. that. Even today, as a adult, I watched that. I'm like, this was intelligently written. It was a clever stories. The artwork was beautiful. It's, it's like yeah. it's a very. The thing is, it's a very mature show. There was a lot of there was a lot of shit in some of the Batman series and some, especially some of the like uh, animated movies that they've done. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of mature content in, in a lot of Batman stuff. Uh, yeah. Batman just sets himself up, man, and like Gotham and the shit he's dealing with, he sets himself up for. Appealing to a more mature audience than uh, than some other but I remember, superheroes. But I remember even as a kid watching, like, oh, that was entertaining. It was also kind of like a you could tell there's something deeper going on. And as we watching it as an adult, it's like, oh, okay, this is where the deepness was going. Now I understand what the what they're trying to get at. Yep. All right. What if anything is too serious to be joked about? Abortion. Yeah. Why? Uh, killing babies is bad, dude. I'm, I'm so, this is, this is weird, man. I'm atheist, uh, or, or agnostic, whatever you want to say that I am. You know, if you got to put a, put a title on it, like, I don't, I don't believe in religion. Um, 
but I believe that killing babies is bad, not because of religion. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, the anti-abortion or the pro-life stuff is easily derailed or debunked because they always justify it or rationalize it with religion. Mm-hmm. And then people always attack the religion aspect of it, which is easy. But the objective stuff is you're killing a baby. Mm-hmm. So uh, in utero, they're like, oh, it's a group of cells. And you're like, nah, motherfucker. Like if you were in the commission of a felony <laughs> and you <laughs> contributed to this baby in utero, this fetus, this group of cells, whatever you want to call it to dehumanize it, dying and not otherwise being born after a nine-month uh, gestation period – into a living, breathing human being, you'd be charged with feticide, which is a felony, at least in the state of Georgia. Yeah, I remember that. Um, so, yeah, that, shit, that shit's wrong as... Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to use that old Southern expression. It's wrong. That's wrong. It's bad. Um, it's, 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 it's bad, man. It shit's, uh, it's no good. So, and some of the reasons that people use it justify it's bad. So, I'll even say, you know, they're talking about like Roe v. Wade and all this crap, man. Uh, as a... It's a form of birth control. Yeah. It's 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 bad, man. I don't well, you you're fucking you're terminating a pregnancy. And that's what people like to use that word. You're you're terminating a pregnancy. <laughs> so, you know, you, you just you just killed a fucking baby, right? Like if you didn't do shit, a baby would happen. And then being a father of two little girls, man, and my wife haven't had two two miscarriages. Mm, no. One while I was in Afghanistan, uh as a, as a really young, impressionable man. My mom said a few too. Uh, yeah, dude, I don't like I don't like talking about abortion. Abortion's rough for me. My That's my, it. my thing is like I. That's one thing I am conflicted about because. One like if a woman's raped or something like, can you really judge her for that? But then also too, it's like the other side what you just said too. This should not be used as a birth control method. Yeah, if you use, and so that's why I like to say the birth control method because people always like to throw out, you know, that's the that's the the trump card is um, mm-hmm. rape, incest, yeah, shit like that, whatever you know. But that's it's a real small portion of the of even claimed or alleged reasons mm-hmm. why people get abortions. Man, abortion is uh, abortion is birth control far outnumbers. And I'm not going to throw out any made-up stats, but there's there's considerably more abortions for just convenience than there are for that. And uh, it's weird for me too, man, because uh, I think uh, shit. I don't even know how to say it. My my grandmother offered to pay for my abortion. Oh fuck! That's fucked up. Yep. Yeah. So. Shit. Abortions. Abortions. Weird, man. I don't like it. I don't like abortion. So that's too serious to be joked about. Everything else, man, that shit is fair game. <laughs> I, I had, a, Yeah, I had a friend who... Uh, I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want... Um, let's say somebody close to... Let's say okay, no, his father tried to have to talk the mother into the abortion. And I think the grandfather... Or his grandfather, the, the father to the mother... Punched him in the face. <laughs> he knocked. He punched him in the face. Like, oh, okay, you get knocked out. Yeah, but for them, that's the only thing too serious to be joked about, man. I, can't, yeah. I That's the thing that I can't personally joke about. I can't. I can't talk about. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's delicate. Um, okay, this is a little deep one. When was the first time you fell in love, and how did that happen? Fuck, dude. Uh, so, I was going to church. Mm-hmm. I was homeschooled. So, obviously, any girls that I'm going to meet are girls that are going to church, right? Mm-hmm. 15, 16 years old. Hormones are raging. There's this chick that's there. Um, she and I end up falling in love, I guess. Um, we dated off and on for about four years. Lost our virginity to each other. Um, our, our relationship kind of crashed and burned a couple of times, but it, you know the final time was pretty was pretty bad. And there's still a lot of like hard feelings and weirdness. In the same token, there's still a lot of emotion that's attached to it. Mm. So even now, years years later, um, 
you know, more than 14 years later, 15 years later, I can still look back and the thought of her or the, the mention of her name or whatever takes me back to when I was 15, 16 years old and what our relationship was and the emotions that I felt in. So um, what contributed to it? I don't know. Maybe it was environmental, you know. Uh, she was there. She was a little bit younger than me, you know. She had boobies. And, uh, yeah, there we go. Tits and uh, ass. Yeah, she, she was. No, she, no, she, I say that, man. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to take that away from her. Yeah, yeah. So she and I are, aren't cool. We mm -hmm. don't talk. We haven't talked in a long time. Um, you know, for, for, for a lot of reasons. But um, no, I, don't, I don't want to take that from her and, 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 and act like that's all she was, was just, you know, a piece of meat or whatever. But I think it was kind of environmental, contributed a lot to it. Mm hmm. Uh, you know, going to church and the way our, our parents were and our age and, you know, opportunity, availability, availability, mm -hmm. uh, jeopardy, you know what I mean? Like all the, so, I mean, it was, it was there. So that, that contributed the most to it, you know, and then just, just for all, we're all fucking hormones of teenagers and shit like that, man. But we, we were together for a long time and, and, uh, pretty significant. I don't know. I've talked to some people, you know, and, and sometimes their first was kind of like, oh, whatever. Uh -huh. uh, for me, it, I'm one of those dudes um, that it's kind of stuck with me. So I, I, I'll take that shit to the grave, you know, having that that emotional and physical significance of that, that first girlfriend that I had, that first time I ever had sex with a girl or whatever. And, you know, that'll, that'll, I'll carry that forever. Yeah, I completely understand because I didn't fall in love for the first time until I was 28. Jesus Christ. Well, the thing I was a late bloomer. I didn't lose my virginity until 23, 22, 23. But this is the first woman I fell in love with. And, uh, and it badly. I didn't really badly, uh, ca cause me to have a mistrust in women, which is actually f finally starting to go away. But it's like, it's what you said. That pain is still there. Yeah, it's real. And, man. but I heard something the other day. It's like, I'm so, I learned to accept that and be grateful for it. Like, it's so like, you no, know that pain is there because I, I truly love this woman. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a good thing if you're a man or even a, wo a woman too. You still feel like that towards your fir the first person you fall in love with. I think that shows like you are a, a good sign of a good person that you felt like that. You yeah, feel man, like that's that. That's that process. It's made you who you are. Mm -hmm. Part of the puzzle. Part of the puzzle. <laughs> it sucks, man, but you gotta you gotta go through it. So it's yeah. part of the journey of life. Yep. Only, and surprisingly, I find out not a lot of people go through that. So they just really? got to be. Um, they, just, they just skip that shit? Or well, what? like, I got in, some insight when I did the interview with the the sex psychologist, the, the th sex therapist. Um, I want, it's like with, well, with the whole posturing thing. A lot mm. of people posture like, yeah, you know, my first love wasn't that shit. Well, I had so many girlfriends. And she so kind of put things in perspective. How uh, and it was not only her, but I remember my mentor back in college, a professor that was really great professor. He donated two million dollars to the school because he's fucking rich. Jesus, but like uh, he put a lot of things in perspective, and she did. Then she kind of added on to that ten years, nearly ten, ten years later. Um, especially in today's age, where we're dealing with people being less social, uh, a lot of people. Don't fall in love until the late thirties or maybe forties. And she told me this. Well, she told me. I think she said it on air, but she on uh, pace of confidentiality. She only gave the details and not the person's name and stuff. But she said that uh, she's dealing. She was dealing with a patient that this guy was a handsome guy, well, got his shit together, uh, you know, doing really well job wise, has a nice car. He comes to her and he's never, no, ha never had sex. I think he's late thirties, but she's like everything else. This guy is healthy and normal. He he has friends. He hangs out with people. It's just it just hasn't happened. So like I think it's just a little bit more common than we than people let on. Yeah, yeah, I can see that, man. And, and, and I'd probably be a little bit more prepared to deal with. Or maybe have a little bit more of a, an objective, logical, thinking man's response mm -hmm. to that kind of situation later in life than I did then. You know, maybe I had more of an emotional response. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, well I'm not mad at it. Like I said, man, I like things you know you maybe you could change, but you don't know how it would kind of fuck up what you what you did change. You know, it's I, I kind of think to like a Back to the Future. You know, <laughs> Back to the Future. Right, right. When uh, when 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 dude's like doing stuff, you know, and then he slowly starts disappearing, like, oh shit, you know, like a fucking, <laughs> oh, fuck. yeah, right, like, they, yeah. they made out with his mother, like, what the fuck, right, like, I, <laughs> I understand the significance of the shit that I went through, yeah. and the stuff that I've dealt with, and the stuff that I've done, and how that's brought me to where I am, <clears throat> and if I'm always looking back, and kind of like regretting, or, or wondering, what if, we could what if this motherfucker to death, right? Like, I just focus more on the now and the future. Well, the, and appreciate appreciate what happened. Yeah, just take it. Felt take as a lesson for the woman that you, you, you're in love with. Like, hey, you no, know, this this woman made me better, made me a better man for you. Yeah, so that's the only way I could really just put it as. Okay, what? Actually, we do a fun one. What's the largest animal you think you could fight in one? <laughs> oh shit, dude! I don't know. Animals are, animals are crazy. Man. I'm gonna say a dog. I'm gonna draw the line at a dog because, like, the reality of having some in, some some bad encounter with a dog in law enforcement is pretty pretty good. Well, and and like, dude, I, I think about it all the time, man. I'm like, I do not want to have to fucking shoot a dog, man. Me and uh, me and my rookie last week, we wrote a call where this dog was like attacking this dude. You know, it was an animal complaint call, and we went over there, and I was like, I fucking hope we don't have to shoot a dog, man. Because people, like, you shoot a person, they're like, eh. You know, you shoot a dog, or a dog gets hurt, they're like, oh, my God, you know, you shot this fucking dog, right? Like, people put, they heap this, this expectation on dogs, you know. They're, I don't know. They hold ho- dogs on a higher level than, than people. I'm not one of those. I'm not one of those people. I'm not a dog person. I get it. <laughs> I empathize, but I'm not. I'm not there with you. I say a dog, man. I, I went to a call yesterday or day before, man. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm I'm like knocking on the gate and like rattling it before I open it. And the dude that was on the call with me, he's like, "Dude, what are you doing?" I was like, "I'm making sure there's not a fucking dog in this backyard, dude." He said, "What are you talking about?" I was like, "One, I don't want to get my ass eaten by some you know big ass Rottweiler." I was like, two, I don't want to have to shoot somebody's dog." You know, to 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 protect myself, to keep from getting my ass eaten by a big ass Rottweiler. So. Y'all say a dog. Dog's about the biggest animal you can really like go toe to toe with and kind of win. And that's a reality in my the reality mind. trick. Yeah, I remember when you said that. I remember a story. Um, this is when I was doing that training, to become a detective. Uh, you guys came with me to go um, serve a warrant, and uh, the guy ran in the backyard. I remember it was either you or somebody else got on the radio like, "Okay, he's running in the backyard." And I went. You, I was in the front of the house. I. Is this off of Tanglewood? I can't remember. No, this was, was like... Windsor Forest? This was in Precinct 5. We had to go to Precinct 5 oh, for shit. it. Oh, shit. I was about to say. Uh, we, you, uh, <laughs> you started running in the backyard. I was falling behind you. I was in my, my dress clothes. You were in uh, the CSU uniform. <laughs> and you just turned around like, fuck it, dog. <laughs> there was a little group of dogs oh, in the backyard. <laughs> I jumped the fence into, with the dogs. The dogs just looked at me like, what the fuck is this guy doing? <laughs> I think I think I remember some 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 vague pieces of that. Now that you bring it up, that's funny, man. Yeah, dogs, dude. I, and it's not, it's, like, it's, it's, not that I'm, it's not that I'm scared. It's not that I'm, I'm scared of dogs. Like I respect dogs and what dogs can do. But they're anybody, dangerous. That, anybody that thinks that I used to have a German Shepherd, he's about ninety pounds. Um, anybody that thinks that that dog won't won't fucking kill you is wrong because he can. He's got the tools. Mm-hmm. I watch. I've, I've I've been part of and I've seen plenty of canine apprehensions. Mm-hmm. See what a sixty-pound Malawa can do to somebody. Like a dog will fucking ruin you. Um, but the biggest thing is, I don't want to have to shoot somebody's dog, man. I don't want to put myself in. I don't want to. I don't want to put myself in a position where I feel that I need to shoot somebody's dog or shoot a dog when I could have avoided that situation. So I'm cautious about backyards and dogs yeah. for that reason. Because people are, I mean, dude, I'm with them, man. If I had a, if my, my, my shepherd. Mm-hmm. If some cop would have jumped my backyard and my shepherd would have, you know, put the fear of God in his ass, you know, and he, he shot my shepherd, I'd have been well, it's like I'd another right child. with him. I'd have been mad, man. Like That's part of family. It's like another child. Yeah, man. I, I use Gus, the, my shepherd, as a reference, man. I've had other dogs. Gus was the most significant. The, it's a good dog. Well, dogs. The thing is, 
about dogs they were raised from with us since we um since we left the cave <laughs> basically yep. since we left the cave dogs have been with us and uh they're one of the only animals that looks us in the eye too if oh, not it's not the only animal that looks us in the th- eye there's another thing they do that no other animal can will do only humans and dogs if you point at something the dog they will look, look at, at yeah they'll look at yeah, they look at do that they also have like a left eye gaze or whatever like people identify with each other's I saw this on a fucking YouTube video so this might be <laughs> total bullshit dude. people gaze to like the left eye the mm-hmm. left eye is what you usually focus on and dogs will look at a picture and then like look at the left eye like it's it's what they do it's mm-hmm. weird man and they look at they look at people's left eye. I gotta look that up because that's I didn't I didn't know about that. That's actually pretty interesting. Some YouTube video or Discovery <laughs> Channel video. Look it up. Oh, yeah, better be Discovery. <laughs> that's some that's some guy in a. Now, Discovery's right. falling off lately, man. With that Shark Week bullshit, dude. They got all those clickbait crazy videos they're doing now. It's like not even real, not even real shit anymore. It's all bogus. Yeah, that's uh, stuff like Netflix and HBO and Hulu and shit is putting putting them out of business. Oh too. hell yeah. Okay, what is what was the most terrifying moment in your life? I don't know, man. Terrifying, terrifying's weird. This is a weird thing to talk about because, like, for example, Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. So I got to Afghanistan, scared shitless. Nobody wants to admit it. Scared out of my fucking mind. Like I'm gonna die. Part of my motivation to get married before I went to Afghanistan as a 20 year old man was. I'm going to go to Afghanistan and die, and I don't want to die having never been married. Let me get married now. Yeah. That's, that's no shit. One of the major reasons I got married. Um, so over there was like a fear deferment kind of thing. So we deal with like terrifying shit all the time. Rocket attacks. BRP, you know, take RPGs. Hit with IEDs. Uh, take direct fire, you know, small arms fire uh, from, from enemy or whatever. It's terrifying stuff, man. But it was like a fear deferment kind of thing. Like I deferred all that fear t- after I got back. So after you get back and shit starts winding down, that's when you're like, fuck, dude. Like I almost died a bunch of times. You know, that's when it starts to bother you. That's when it starts to keep you awake at night and stuff. Mm-hmm. Or me. I say you. Me. Making this impersonal. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when it started to keep me awake at night. Uh, so it was weird. Here in, in police work, it's strange because... You wake up and you see your family. And then, then you go to work. And then some shit happens, that foot pursuit. And then you backtrack and you find that gun that that guy elected to throw down instead of use against you. Or maybe you're fighting a guy, wrestling with him, you get him in handcuffs, and then you find out that what he was reaching for in front of him was a gun in his waistband that he wanted to use. And then after the adrenaline wears off, all that other stuff, you... You get done with doing your reports. You go home. You see your family. Your wife wants to know why you're home late. You know, like, no, I wasn't at my girlfriend's house. I was fucking busy at work, you know. And <laughs> you sit there, you try to play it cool, and eat supper, and you go to sleep, and then you think about, like, shit, man. Like, that was, that was pretty close. And then you wake up and you go to work again. So it's kind of weird. You don't get to get sucked into that environment to where you just defer it to where you accept your mortality uh-huh. you're just there you're in it you got to go back and forth between extremes so as far as work's concerned plenty of times countless times i've been scared people don't like to use the s word but fear is real it needs to be felt if you don't feel fear or you're trying to act hard one you're either you're either posturing or two you're complacent and you're, you're really running the risk of getting fucking killed um but as far as just like fear, like shit that I hate on myself, like like getting tased. <laughs> when I was, yeah, that's when I was getting taser certified, man. Like I had like a bad reaction. That, that was a total pussy, man. Really? I, was, I was soft as fuck. She scared the hell out of me, man. I did not want to get tased. Uh, heights, heights scare the shit out of me. Yeah, the I older that. I get, the more afraid of heights I am. I'm terrified of heights. So I don't know. I've had I've had innumerable incidents. Yeah, uh, in the military and in, in law enforcement, where I've been scared, um, but I've kind of come up with my own techniques and stuff how to deal with it. And you, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You've been in, yeah, like yeah. it's. Well, I haven't been in a as long as you have, and, and plus, I haven't been in a, the military either. So you, yours is very uh, more uh, intense than what I had to go through. Plus. I think it would have been different if I had family. It, 
Maybe. I think it will be a more intense fear. Maybe. It's, it's maybe just maybe, maybe because of my you know my time in, in the career, like mm-hmm. I've had more incidents, but the significance of the is is not changed by the the number of incidents. Like you you you've had enough. You know, I mean, I, I know you. I worked with you for a while, <laughs> so you, you know you know what you know how it is. Man, you just get you just get scared. Shit scares you. Yeah, and and one thing I learned, like it's there's nothing wrong with saying you're afraid. Like there's something wrong with being a coward. There's yeah. so, there's something wrong with being a coward, not especially when you're a cop or military. You you chose this job. Mm-hmm. We're, there's a voluntary force. Um, do, would you freeze sometimes or go in shock? Yeah, that happens. It, it does happen, but I don't think that's considered cowardice. I just think like if, if you're new to it, it's like oh fuck, yeah, shit just got real. But there's something. There's a difference between uh that and actually meaning that you're afraid because. It's healthy to admit to you're you're afraid, but as long as you support that with courage and bravery and yeah yeah and something you're, healthy, you're going to behavior. you're going to like a fucking robbery call yeah or whatever either either that or on a subject stop where you've had like shots fired or, or high crime area and you feel it you feel it in your chest man you feel it welling up in you and you're like here we go you know <laughs> and you, you stop and you get out of your car and, and you know you get in that foot pursuit or or whatever or in the military you know I did rock clearance and. Or do they be mounted or dismounted, you know, in a vehicle or out of a vehicle looking for IEDs, looking for bombs? There's some times where you're not sure about something and it's pretty sketchy. And you're like, hmm, all right, here we go. <laughs> and you, you either drive or you step on or over, over whatever, you know. And you just got to, you got to, you just swallow it. You know, you're like, oh, here we go. Search warrants, you know. You, buddy breaches that door. You're number one, man. And you're like, man. Hope I don't get shot in the fucking face. All right, here we go. And you step in the door anyway, you know, like. <laughs> it's like, oh, just, fuck. Here we just, go. You just do it, man. You just do it. You just put that away. Well, like. Uh, people that live in careers, people that work in careers where they, they haven't ever had to experience that. No. Uh, yeah. they're, getting, they're getting fucking cheated, man. I think, like, and it's not, it's not for everyone because I, I strongly believe, like, the whole tribe thing. Like, if we were a tribe of people, there's only going to be a small percentage of people. Like, if there's a tribe of 150 people, let's just do 100, just simple math. I believe one or two percent will actually, one or two people will actually be the warriors. And there'll be a couple support people yeah, behind man. them. But I, I think that's fine. Not doing this type of work or doing the military work. It's not for everyone, but you need to go experience something dangerous once in your life. The tribe shit makes you do it, though, man, because, like, if it's just you by yourself solo. Mm-hmm. Stepping on what might be a ID, or stepping through a door where there might be a bad guy to shoot you in the face, uh, you know, based on whatever intelligence you've gathered, who's supposed to be in that house, and what is what his history is like, what he's about, or she. Um, yeah, man. Uh, if it's just you by yourself, maybe you'll be like, "Dude, fuck this," you know. But if it's you and you look back over your shoulder and there's like nine of your homies there looking at you. <laughs> Bro, what's up? What's taking so long? You know, you're like, oh shit. You think you're sucking yourself out. Yeah, you know, all my boys are here, man. I can't, I can't look like a pussy in front of them. Like, let's get it. So, <laughs> there's something to be said for that. Yeah, but um, makes you feel alive. One thing I, I kind of noticed, and uh, some older people I talked to, and I think we have it more fortunate being our generation, is that people, uh, especially with men, that we're willing, really, we're more willing to talk about it. And I think that's a lot more healthier. I think it's more even more braver too. It's like, hey, that, I oh, I crap myself. <laughs> like I literally crap yeah, myself yeah. on that call. It took me it took me a long time to come around to that man. And I think going through my deployment and then dealing with trying to internalize stuff and being just a fucking asshole to my wife that I was man after I came back and, and just my home life, you know. Um, I learned some lessons from that mm. to now with the police department. And, and doing stuff that I do in police work, I'm, I'm more apt to talk about it and verbalize it than I was. And I'm more honest with it, more honest with myself and then honest with other people about it and whether or not it was scary or, or whatever, you know, well, like, whatever the emotion that was felt with it. I'm like, I, I voice that and I talk about it because it's better, man. I, I don't want to, I don't want to keep it inside and let it wreck my life. You know, like, like some of these dudes, World War II <laughs> Vietnam vets, did, Oof, you know, man. I can't imagine coming home to a to a world to a country that's not prepared to receive them 
Yeah, they had it rough. You know, I, I've been I've been thanked for my service and, and and all kind of stuff more times than I can count, man. And, and the, the American public has been more than receptive to everything that I've done. I'm even thanked, dude. I got thanked today, man. At this this law enforcement thing, I was at this training thing for my service as a police officer, man. And uh, we came in. It's just a, it's just a job. I do it. I do it for fun. I do it for room and board. If I didn't have a wife and kids, you know, to to provide for, I would do it for room and board. Like I just love it. Um, but yeah, so I, I I came home with something different than they did, you know, and they had to, you know, they had to like internalize all that shit. And sadly, it was there was a lot of reasons for that. One was maybe the culture at the time, the upbringing too, and um, but also there's some there's a rare. It is brave to be vulnerable. Like, actually, you meant, like, hey, guys, um, I didn't feel good about that call. Mm-hmm. And this is the reason why I didn't feel good about it. Like, I, you know, I go back to that. I crapped myself on that. When I saw the guy's gun, kind of, you know, scared the shit out of me. Literally scared the shit out of me. There's a bravery to that, too. Like, you know, you're, you're revealing a very vulnerable part of yourself. To yeah. a bunch of men, like you want, you need to, you want their acceptance, and um, you know, you don't want to be taken as a pussy or anything. But no, you found out, I found out that that's not the case. Like, you know, you talk about it, like, oh, yeah, I felt the same way two years ago. They'll start admitting it too. Mm-hmm. This is how I dealt with it. But yeah, we're getting we're getting better at talking about it about stuff. So it's good. Yeah, it's not we're a better for it. There's a difference between that and being a pussy. It's like, uh, no. <laughs> Guys, what's I, I did a couple. Yeah, pussies when you still feel scared and you run away. You yeah, know? yeah, there was being, a being being uh you know doing doing your fucking job and, and and reaching out and grabbing your nutsack and doing what needs to be done is when when you're scared and you're like, no, oh, here we go, fuck it, let's get it, you know. Yeah, you'll feel you'll feel the fear later. All right, what is your most treasured memory? Oh man. Uh... <clears throat> Treasured memory. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, because of the events that surrounded it and emotions and all this other shit, like the the birth of my first child is not quite as vivid as the birth of my second for me. Mm-hmm. So I'll say the uh, my most treasured is probably the the birth of my second child, just because. What happened with the first? No, the, the the first was there, but just like I, I don't I don't remember it as much, right? So I wasn't already a parent, uh-huh. so I didn't already know what it meant to be a parent, and, and I didn't understand the significance or the gravity of having a child born and what that meant. And my, my second daughter, I knew, you know, I knew from the first one, and uh, and so maybe I was more attentive. Uh, yeah, the, the the birth of my second child, that's vivid, mm. it's vivid for me, so. And both both went off without a hitch, you know, no complications oh, or whatever. You know, they were, they were both healthy kids. They still are. Um, yeah, that was probably my most uh, cherished moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's special. Uh, ho- hopefully one day I get to feel that. Oh, yeah. It's good, man. <laughs> it, it, it'll change your life. All right. Um, what was the biggest, biggest sacrifice you made? The biggest sacrifice I ever made. Um, the biggest sacrifice I ever made wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. Um, the biggest sacrifice I've made has been has been other people. So I say that like uh, when I joined the military and went to Afghanistan, it wasn't that big of a deal for me. Um, it didn't bother me that much. It's what I wanted to do. It, you know, it's full of fucking bravado. Like shit made me hard. Like I want to go to war and stack bodies, right? Like uh, <laughs> That was my mindset at the time. But my mom, it fucking wrecked her pretty bad, you know? It bothered my dad, my grandparents, my new pregnant wife. Uh-huh. Uh, and then joining the military again with the propensity of, you know, or with, with the... With the, um, with the understanding of going over going overseas, you know? Like, I'm supposed to be going to Afghanistan. I'm supposed to be starting pre training in October you know, 18th. Uh-huh. A couple, couple weeks here. I'm not going now, you know, I just found that out a couple of weeks ago, but, you know, my, uh, signing up for that with my wife, who's like supportive to a flaw, you know, she's like, oh yeah, do it, do it makes you happy, you know, I'm uh-huh. like, oh, okay, you know, yeah, I'm sacrificing, um, 
potentially sacrificing my, my daughter's time with their family, you know, with, with their dad. Time at, at best. The best case scenario is just time. Just time they spend with their dad. Worst case scenario is I don't fucking come back, you know. If I don't come back, it ain't going to bother me anymore. You know what I mean? I'm going to be over and done with. I ain't going to be thinking about it. They're going to be thinking about it for the rest of their life. Like, oh, my fucking dad died, you know, or, or I never knew my dad, or you know, my youngest daughter's too, you know. She ain't going to remember my ass. She'll have pictures, but, uh, yeah, sacrificing other people for, for, for selfish reasons. And in my opinion, it's selfish. It's shit that I want to do. So I, one of the reasons I got back in was, you know, I wear like a fucking camouflage hat with a flag on it, you know, all the time, like every other, like every other veteran, you know. And I'm proud of my service, and I got a I got a shadow box on the wall about Afghanistan and all. Yeah, this I saw stuff. that when I walked in. Talk about being a veteran and serving a country or whatever, but here I was, late twenties, able-bodied, had experience from a previous deployment, a skill set um, that I developed through years of training and, 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 and some real world experience. And it's like, man, why am I not contributing? Now, granted, what I would contribute would be small. Mm-hmm. But why am I not contributing? I'm, I'm, I am able-bodied and I am not currently doing this. I advocate other people, young men joining and serving their country and and stuff, but I'm sitting here resting on my fucking laurels not doing it, you know. Like, that's bullshit, so... I think, uh, I think, I think my wife's coming in the door. Yeah, I can hear yeah. I can hear <laughs> yeah. the mics. I can hear I think, uh, <laughs> it's Okay, we're, we're almost done. Yeah, so. yeah, that's cool. Actually, we're, next one will be the last question. That was one of the reasons I joined was, um, I felt like I wasn't doing enough. Like, I didn't do enough, so. <laughs> oh, look. <laughs> the little girl. <laughs> All right, this is the last question, oh. and this is a question I asked everyone. I'll uh, wait till the, the wife and the kids go upstairs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll bring him back down to introduce him to you. Yeah, after. that's fine. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want them to listen to this question yet, but um, what's the worst thing you've ever done and what's the best thing you've ever done? So, the worst thing that I've ever done, um, this is going to sound stupid and like, it's not going to make sense, but uh, there's, there's a reason for it. The shit that I did, that I've done, that, that bothers me. And, and maybe it's not going to bother other people or members of your audience mm-hmm. or you won't understand. When I was really young, um, so one, when I was really, really young, my parents were divorced, I think, at the time. So my parents divorced and then remarried each other. Hmm. Huh. Um, after I was born. They got pregnant with me when they were in high school. I was born when my parents were 18. Oh, okay. They divorced and they remarried. But anyway, my dad worked, uh, excuse me, my dad worked uh, for like this John Deere tractor, commercial tractor company thing or whatever. And I was really young. My mom brought me there. They had like a family day at work or whatever. And I was, dude, I'm, I'm fucking young, man. I'm like four. I can barely remember this. And, uh, I remember my dad sitting in the skidder. So this is this logging tractor, that, uh, this cool ass tractor. He was like waving me over, you know. He wanted me to come up there. He's gonna drive me around this fucking tractor. And uh, for some reason, man, like we were in line to get a hot dog or something, you know. And I was like, no, no, I'm not gonna go. And I didn't go. And like to this day, man, I'm I'm fucking I'm a grown ass man. <laughs> I regret not going to get in that tractor with my dad. So that's one. Uh, that's one thing that bothers me, uh, dude. I don't know why. Like I, I have dreams about this kind of shit. Um, another one, man, me and my uncle, I've got an uncle that's 18 months older than I am. He and I grew up like brothers. He's mm-hmm. also in law enforcement. We're playing, uh, out on this, in the land, you know, where, where we're from in, uh, in Northeast Georgia. And we end up like this limb had been cut down. We dragged this limb out of the way and there's like a field mouse, you know? And I always remember my mom being like afraid of mouse, you know, uh, mice and uh, having mouse traps and stuff like that. And. So I see this mouse, and I'm like, oh, mouse is bad, right? So, like, I, the mouse is sitting there, like, scared shitless. And I'm like, dude, I, I, was, like, I was like five, man, six. And I, like, stomp on this fucking mouse. I kill this mouse. It bothers the shit out of me. You know what? You're not, you're not the first person to sit down on the podcast uh, 
food truck episode, he said the same thing. I, I, I ended up making the same thing, too. But it was a hamster. Really? Maybe, dude, baby hamster. It fucking, dude, that, that bothers it, it fu- the shit out yeah, of me. Yeah, it fucks man. me up. That fucks me up. And, and to, the same, to the same token, not something I feel bad about, the worst thing I ever did, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like, I remember same same house, my grandparents' house, this, uh, where they had a cat. You know, this cat that lived outside, and this cat had... Uh, this cat had um, grabbed this mole, you know, this uh, mole that was digging up the yard. Mm-hmm. And he kind of played with it and hurt it or whatever, and the thing was still alive. So, like, I, like, euthanized it with a BB gun. Mm-hmm. I think I'm, like, six years old when I did this, you know. That, that fucking bothers me, thinking about that thought. But I've, I've euthanized a lot of animals. My grandfather took me to put down a dog when I was, like, eight. First dog I ever put. Like, <laughs> I've euthanized a lot of animals. Kind of kind of traumatized my youth. But, uh, dude, I'm serious, man. I'm not saying, like, I haven't done other stuff that's wrong. You know, the stuff that's bad. But, uh, you know, stomping on that mouse, dude. That, that bothers me. And what's the best thing you've ever done? Man, the best thing I've ever done. I don't like to think about that because, or I, I don't typically think that way because I don't like to. Well, something that. Two, two mile horn, you know, but, um. Mm-hmm. Best thing I've ever done. And this is turning back to like a selfish kind of thing, I guess. Is just being a dad, man. To these these two little girls who just walked upstairs. <laughs> That's the best thing I've ever done, as far as what's made me the happiest and given me the most drive and purpose and steered my life and changed my priorities from me to them. Is yeah, being a dad, having little girls. It's the best. It's the best shit that ever happened to me. Yeah, that's one thing. Uh, only I'm looking forward to. Like I want to have daughters. It's cool, man. I thought I wanted a little boy, real bad. You know, mm-hmm. every dude wants a little boy. I had a little, had a little girl first, and then when my wife was pregnant the second time, um, and my daughters are seven and, and two, and uh, she got pregnant the second time. I like everybody's like, "Oh, I know you want a little boy." I'm like, "No, I don't, man. I wanted a little girl." Mm-hmm. Like, like Sayla's awesome. I want a, I want a second daughter. So. The, daughters, <laughs> the, first, the first one was awesome. Let's do yeah, the daughter, daughters are where it's at. And they're so different, man. They're so different, but they're their own little people. They're cool. They're cool. I love them. All right. Well, I want to thank you for doing the episode. That was great, man. This is fun, dude. Yeah, that was great, man. I like, I like listening to your podcast, and uh, it's neat that, you know, working together and stuff, and then coming back and doing this. And yeah. I, I haven't seen you in like well, I thought I was gonna, five years, I thought, four years. I thought I was going to see you at Diane's. Um, Going away or retirement party? I went yeah, to that. man, I was at uh, dude, I was in. I don't know if I was at bomb. I was in school to be a bomb tech. Or oh, okay. what, man, I, I was. I was doing something. I was at way at training. No, when did she leave? See, if... it was last. It was last year. No, was it last year? Okay, yeah, it was, af- yeah. Summer it was after pe- fall. It was after Peplos <laughs> wedding. <laughs> it was last year. I think it was at bomb training, or I was in a military school. I was at something, but I couldn't be there. I was pissed. When was it? Oh, uh, anyway, yeah, I was, I was hoping to see you. Uh, got to see everyone else there. Yeah, I'm gonna. I got. I got to holler at Mason. I was texting him earlier today. I got to tell him I, I was on your podcast. <laughs> Fuck <Fucking> him. <laughs> oh man, I miss that guy. <laughs> yeah, he's good. He's good people, man. I still laugh at. Um, I'm not sure if you remember that story during Christmas. Um, the Jordans or something happened, and he got pepper sprayed by accident. Yeah, dude, I remember. <laughs> I'm that. still laughing. I'm still laughing yeah, about that. And everybody was trying to bug break into the mall because they were releasing like some Jordan, you know, re-release or whatever. And uh, he was there at the at the front of the door trying to keep all the the people from busting in the door. And mall security guy like stuck this pepper spray out and just started pepper spraying the crowd at random. But Ham caught like ninety <laughs> percent of it in the face. Him, him. him and uh, O'Brien. <laughs> O'Brien. Called a bunch. All right. Good well, stuff. all right, guys. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for letting me come back to Savannah and do this in your house. It was nice. Uh, if you guys want to check out any other episodes, it's for free on any, actually, most distributors, podcast b- distributors. If you can't find it on your distributor, go to the website, atabulife.com, where you can download it for free there. Also, there's other episodes some fun articles short stories and poems because i am that sappy so come check out the website atabulife.com thanks again andrew and uh yeah man you, you guys have a great week